first of all, I'm going to ask everybody if uh, to mute your lines. I'll have Kathy remind us a little bit. So, I'd like to call this meeting in order. Kathy, if you can lead us in the pledge. Yes, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Roll call. Councilmember Connie. Yes. Rodriguez. Present. Strong. Here. Stransky. Yes. Mayor Gonzalez. Here. All right. So I'll just read this again. Due to the provisions of the governor's executive orders N2520, which suspend certain requirements of the Brown Act and the order of the health officer of the county of Mendocino, shelter in place, minimize the spread of COVID-19, the city council members will be participating by teleconference in the meeting of June 24, 2020. And public communication now, item two. Council welcomes participation in its meetings. Comments shall be limited to three minutes per person so that everyone may be given an opportunity to be heard. Expedite matters and avoid repetition whenever any group of persons wishes to address the council on the same subject matter, the mayor may require that a spokesperson be chosen by the group. This item is limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the city council which are not on the posted agenda. Public criticism of the city council, commissions, boards, and agencies will not be prohibited However, no action shall be taken. I always like to explain that because it's not agendized, let's say you want us to look at a pothole or something and direct staff to look at this. All right. Do I have any members of the public that would like to speak? Can I just get a clarification? You're saying that point two is not open to matters under point three at this time? Yeah, if there's something we've agendized to talk about, then we'll open it up to talk about that. This is just for something that's not on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Right. So is there hey, This is John Alameda, and I've got a uh, question for you. If you remember last year in the fall, you wrote a letter to PG&E, and that time uh, I came to the meeting and requested that you ask them to charge the substation with portable power and these outages so Tier 1 would have power. After that, I came to another meeting where the city manager said that she got a call from PG&E saying that they would do that. And I wanted to find out what the status is because of last week, I uh, listened to the meeting, the webinar from PG&E, and they talked about Fort Bragg is set up to have power and Eureka is set up to have power. Unfortunately, I couldn't type in my remarks. I was wanting to ask a question about Willits would like to find out what the status is and can and with us. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is the city manager. Um, Mayor, if you would like me to respond briefly, I can, or I can wait until my remarks. City manager would march. Respond. I think we kind of gave us this before, but I think some folks maybe didn't get a chance to get it. So if we could just quickly. Um, sure, I would love to respond. Um, pg and &E actually at first said that they weren't going to be able to energize our substation. However, since that time, they tried extra hard and just announced to us that they have completed the hardening for the substation. And they are prepared in the case of the PSPS. Um, if it doesn't affect Willis, they will be, they have uh, several generators ready to go there and would be able to um, energize most of the city of Willis, uh, not outside of the boundaries, but within the city in, in the case of PSPS so that they were successful. Um, they're also giving us a generator and using our community center as a community resource center in case of the PSPS. So that's all good news. I just wanted to report that. Thank you, Stephanie, for that update. Anybody else from the public that would like to speak on matters not on the agenda? I do. Can you hear me? Yes, please state your name. My name is Sherry Ebion. Okay. Go ahead, Sherry. Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak regarding the urgency ordinance 
that was voted down at the last meeting. Uh, um, COVID-19 is not winding down. In places that have reduced safety precautions, they are experiencing a huge surge in new cases. Researchers say 95% of people in the U.S. would need to wear masks in order to significantly curb the number of deaths. 26 U.S. states are seeing rising cases of the disease. Wearing masks can reduce transmission of the virus by as much as 50%. And those who refuse are putting their lives, their families, their friends, and their communities at risk. We have a number of other ordinances that we follow when what we do affects the lives of other people. We are not allowed to smoke in public places. We have to drive within the speed limit. We're not allowed to drive while intoxicated. These are, to me, that it's really no different than that, that when our behaviors can potentially harm others, we have those behaviors reined in. And I see this as following in that same realm. When we enter Willits, there's a sign that was put up by the Chamber of Commerce saying, we're all in this together. And the first time I saw that, I thought, right on, because that really is the attitude I think we need to have. I know we have a business community, we have an educational community, but we have a community, all of us. And I think that's the community that we need to try to hold together instead of dividing into different splinter groups. And um, going forward, I think we need, yeah, doing everything we can that might help all of us feel safe, more safe, is really urgent. So I hope the council will revisit this, especially in light that COVID is winding up, not winding down. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, anybody else from the public that would like to speak on matters not on the agenda? All right. This now we'll move to public matters. Item three. Um, 3A, approve amendment to settlement agreement litigation between Brook Trails Township Service District and the City of Willits for disposal of wastewater into the city wastewater treatment and disposal facilities. And just to kind of explain to the public, Brook Trails doesn't have their own sewer plant. They um, basically send it down the hill to Willits. That was done many years ago. So, Stephanie, could you... Uh, I was muted. Um, Mayor, Council Members, this is Stephanie Gerbrandt, Sierra, City Manager. Um, the item before you is regarding, um, in order to resolve issues left unresolved in prior litigation, in 2015, the City of Willits and the Township of Brook Trails um, entered into a settlement agreement, which provided for studies and accounting to be performed um, so that they could come up with a new annual rate for the disposal of wastewater to the wet wastewater treatment plant. Um, we had an auditor come and uh, look at the various calculations between Brook Trails and the City of Willits. And um, after that study was completed, the parties um, began to talk some more about what that annual rate should be. Um, the ad hoc committee between Brook Trails and Willits got together and had a very productive discussion early this year and um, came up with some, some the major uh, points of the litigation that could be settled. And the big one there was the annual rate. And so this amendment to the settlement agreement represents those settlement terms discussed by the ad hoc committees of both Brook Trails and the city. And those terms, again, include the, the fair yearly rate, the annual escalation over the next five years, and, they, and the parties also agreed to conduct a joint future rate study in 2025. Um, and this is great because we can do this together. Um, I think the parties are getting along very well, and we've been discussing things freely. Um, the 
actual rate that was decided on was $28,000 per month. The parties also agreed that the ad hoc was going to keep on meeting to discuss the various other issues that, that come up and some a few other unresolved issues. Um, the city, the township of Brook Trails has seen this agreement and has approved it. And so this, this agreement is up for the city council to approve. And once we approve that, we'll be good to go. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Did you get a reading from Brook Trails Meter? Um, in the course of the litigation, um, and that when the when the um, the auditors came, there were a lot of readings taken. I know there was a pretty complete study done of the flow rates. I asked personally, did you get a reading? from the Brook Trails meter. Did I? I? I did not. I don't know if Scott Herman is on the line. I don't know whether he has. I can certainly ask him and, and bring that back. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is Scott here. All right, oh, Scott. great. Hey, uh, uh, Larry, um, we did not get a reading from the Brook Trails meter. Um, up on the park course, but we did give them plenty of data from the one um, on Mill Creek Drive in Northbrook. Thank you. Right. Madge, do you have any questions? Oh, no, I don't think so. Something crossed my mind a minute ago. Um, if, if it comes back, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Is that it? No, no questions. Right. Sabrina, do you have any questions? No, I believe that uh, the city's worked long and hard on this, and uh, I'm appreciative of the agreement that is, uh, that is we've put together. And thank you for everybody who worked hard on making this happen. Thank you. I did remember when I, I just wanted to comment that this agreement specifically doesn't tie the rate to an exact percentage of the flow and all that. It, it gets around uh, getting lost in the weeds with those technicalities with just a flat rate that both uh, Brook Trails and the city felt was extremely fair and that that was considered a, a much more expeditious way to resolve this than to go into the weeds and try to get every penny accounted for that way. So at this point, I will if anybody from the public would like to speak onto this. Ready? Okay, I guess I'll bring it back up and I'll just again echo what uh, Sabrina said. I want to thank uh, Ian Madge and um, Williams, Ed Fork, and uh, our respective managers and, uh, and some other staff folks involved. and. Uh, Everybody did a good job. We came together. We had some questions, and uh, Madge and Rick uh, were able to work those out for us. And kind of our pinch hit squad there. And, and at this point, we're getting along like uh, good siblings, I guess. That's the way I'm it. So, really happy to see that. And uh, so at this point, I'll be looking for a motion. Oh, I'll move approval of the staff recommendation. I'll right, we'll second the motion. Seconded by Sabrina. All right. For the discussion, I don't call for the vote. Kathy? Councilmember Rodriguez? Yes. Connie? Yes. Strong? Yes. Stransky? No. Mary Gonzalez? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, uh, now at this point, we'll move on to item 3A discussion and consideration of a letter from. Willett City Council and the County of Mendocino requesting the 4th of July parade and other gathering activities be canceled respect for the health of the community. And Stephanie. Yes, good. Am I muted? Okay. 
I can hear myself. Um, this is Stephanie Carefant Sierra, city manager, uh, mayor, and council members. Um, for nearly 100 years, the Frontier Days have sponsored a parade, rodeo, and barbecue, and a series of other events for the community, which has brought thousands of visitors to our area on the 4th of July. These events required months of preparation and logistics, and they worked closely with the city in all of the, their events. Um, they worked with us on which security could be hired, where those security would be placed, and um, lots of logistics happened to make these, these events a success. Um, this year's Frontier Days did cancel their event because they um, could not plan because we didn't know what, when the shelter-in-place status would be, and so they did not decided to, to hold off and for the for the good of the community and um, and so we we were not going to have frontier days this year um, the city of well except we do get to wear western wear um, the city of Willits, however became aware of an alternative parade by a group of people who are putting on a celebratory party and parade we hear that that may be a party in the park as well um, they have been encouraging a mass gathering uh, on the sidewalk and the streets and possibly two parks, uh, both the ball field and Rec Grove. Um, I have seen that they have also been asking people to bring alcohol to the park, which is illegal without a permit. Um, the county has been very concerned about this. Dr. Duhan is concerned about this because at this time, the county order does not permit a mass gathering. And this is a violation of the state shelter in place order and the county order and would therefore be a violation of state law. The city council asked uh, me to come back with a, with a letter stating that the city was not in approval of this event. Um, and I worked with the county health official and county council and our own city attorney on drafting a letter, a joint letter from Dr. Duhan and the city of Willits. Um, this is not just because of the danger of community spread, but we are, the county is extremely concerned because the blatant violation of the state order, um, the county is very concerned it could result in the state deciding to roll back the opening of Mendocino County. Um, the governor actually today was on a live conference in which he stated that he was going to withhold funds, county funds from counties that did not comply with the state orders. Um, county actually confirmed that they are they are concerned about this, and that's a real thing. Um, we did not have our talk with Dr. Duham this morning, but. Um, uh, the county administrator did reach out to me and said that that concern is very real. Um, since when I when we drafted this letter and put it in the packet, it was June 17th. At that time, the number of COVID cases in Mendocino County was 48. Less than one week later, that number is now 74. So you're talking about more than a 50% increase in less than one week. Um, clearly, we're concerned. Uh, this is uh, something, we, the staff is also concerned that this group doesn't have permits. Um, we have no insurance. Uh, normally there's insurance that names the city. Um, we're concerned about other types of dangerous situations and property damage. And uh, I've already talked to uh, our police chief is preparing. And if he's on the line, he can also speak to the preparations that he's doing regarding this event. Um, so for your approval is a joint is a draft a joint letter advising the organizers that is that this event is not condoned and asking them to please not go forward um, let's see for the recommended action was also to approve letter for distribution and also room for discussion regarding other possible avenues to control the situation and there that concludes my report unless the chief would like to, to chime in Honor. Okay, um, and uh, I, I did reach out to both the uh, ladies in question and told them about our concerns, and I did inform them that uh, we were sending a letter to them asking them not to do this. And I see this is out of our due diligence, uh, so to ask uh, at this point. So. This 
point, I'm going to just bring council members and then I'll open it up. Larry, do you have anything? Larry? Yeah, no, nothing. Patch? Um, I think I'll wait until I hear from uh, public comments and then make comments then. Greta? Right. I'd like to wait for public comment as well. Um, Sabrina? I guess I'm on the hot seat to give comments before public comment. Um, I would like to reserve the fact to speak after I hear from more public. Um, listening to public is always important, although I do think that uh, I have heard some from some of the public. So I just wanted to share a little bit of that. Um, I share the concerns of the, the city as well as the community uh, about our health and safety and not wanting to uh, spread COVID. Uh, so I do understand uh, where the where the heart of the the letter comes from and wanting to protect our community, I think that that's important. There, I could support this letter with some with some changes, and so um, if you would allow me a, a moment, I would just tell you the, the few changes that I would prefer. Do we have time for that, Mayor? What? Could I point out a few items in the letter that? Uh, that, I'd that I'd like us to consider a change to. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, in the second paragraph, in the second paragraph, the, the word blatant, um, i just like to see that particular word struck from the second paragraph um, because it implies a intent and is accusatory and uh, sets an aggressive tone that I think that... Uh, it may not necessarily be warranted. It, it's based on assumptions. Um, and then uh, I had a question about uh, the reference to Cottonwood. Although the, it did delay a, it did impact their business community and delay um, the opening of, um, of their moving into the next stage, uh, they did not see a uh, they didn't see any increase. Uh, what I was reading on the internet is that they had six cases and none of them were connected to that rodeo. Not to say that they couldn't and that couldn't happen here, but it, I just want to make sure that I'm making a, that we keep that in mind as well. Um, my third uh, statement is about the third paragraph that has the word your proposed celebration and mass gathering. Uh, that might not be the best of uh, um, the best verbiage for that particular sentence because it says proposed celebration mass gathering and I think that based on what I've seen from the two people that the letter is addressed to that they haven't proposed um, a celebration or mass gathering but rather a patriotic procession so um, I, I'm, I'm, I want to be clear I'm not in support of a mass gathering at all but I don't see a problem with a, a procession similar to that that the school district did. Um, and then my last and fourth point is just simply that in the last sen last sentence of the last paragraph, I felt that it was too broad to say that we don't support your actions because the statement is just very, very, very broad. I'd like to see us narrow down what specific actions we don't support. Um, and then I heard the city manager uh, state an allegation that the two individuals have asked people to bring alcohol to the park. And I've been watching their page, and I have seen that, that people have posted on there with varying, varying uh, opinions on what they want to do for the 4th of July. But I haven't personally seen anything from either of these two women that promote that. So I just wanted to, I haven't seen that personally. And then I think that's about it. I'd be happy to hear from the public too. So I have a quick question for you. Was there anything they did to discourage that? In their post? Did their post to discourage that? Yeah. Um, you know what, while I hear from the public, I'll go back and look, look at the most recent stuff. To be honest, I, I haven't combed through every little thing. So. 
I'll do that while, while the rest of the group is talking. Okay. So at this point, I'll open it up to the public. Um, come on, uh, please state your name, and then uh, go on to this. Hi, this is Adriana Wyatt. Thank Hi. you for having this meeting and having us on. My cousin Katie Garcia is also on the line, but um, I'm going to go ahead and go first, if that's okay. Okay. That's okay? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I do want to clarify, uh, as Katie said the last meeting, there is no barbecue planned. There was one comment that I made months ago, maybe two months, like the idea of one barbecue in a comment on one thread. It never went anywhere, as you guys have seen, all of you who are following on Facebook. We are not advertising a barbecue, nor are we advertising a party, and the only gathering is in cars at the baseball fields. And I just really want to echo that I think you guys are really being hypocritical and discriminatory in the sense that you have encouraged and supported the Willis High School celebratory parade, which happened on city property, city roads, where there were teenagers in the backs of trucks driving through town dangerously. I mean, by definition of being unseatbelted, our entire event has just been advocating for the procession of cars, calling for drivers, demanding that anybody who participates follows all laws, which includes following traffic signs, all of that. We didn't even mention a spectator until I spoke to the mayor and Greta, who both had concerns about spectators. At that point, Katie and I reconvened and decided, okay, if there's going to be spectators, which we are not calling for, how can we, how can we cater to that? So we have decided, which you've probably seen on the internet, to go the entire day of the third and draw chalk bubbles to further encourage social distancing. But I remind you and I reiterate that we are not advocating for a mass gathering, but a procession of cars, which the actual COVID-19 California government website advocates for and straight up says, we propose that if you want to have a protest, do it in your cars because that is safe and not a mass gathering. I do echo Rita's comments that the rodeo in Conflict has no ties to uh, COVID. And I also echo that Katie and I share in the concerns of COVID-19 being a very serious virus and being very problematic for the community, and that is why we have worked so hard for months to make sure the event that we are planning is perfectly safe. The only people who are going to be in the cars are ideally family members, the people they would already be hanging out with, and we had not called for spectators, but again, we are going to go out and draw those bubbles, and Katie has even agreed to, to, to print signs that encourage social di social distancing mm -hmm. and And uh, I just want to reiterate that we are protesting the... They, literally protesting you guys, me and Katie are. Other people are welcome to protest whatever they want, Black Lives Matter, which another thing, you guys supported those protests. Not only did you encourage and support those protests, but nobody walked around and enforced the county code there. So that's one more area where you guys are being hypocritical. And to the final point of the hypocrisy, you guys encouraged and supported the high school celebratory parade and the Black Lives Matter protest at times when the COVID-19 restrictions were tighter. So I just want to suggest that you do not send us this letter. I think that it is a viewpoint discrimination. I hear that you've had multiple lawyers on this letter. That's great. However, you guys have said time before in prior conversations that your concerns were some of the the images that were going to be portrayed on these cards, cards such as Trump flags, that's a problem for you guys to say that out loud. But Adriana, I just, I, I just urge up. you to not send us this letter. We're going to have this event. We are trying very hard to be very respectful, social distance. We're going to go out of our way above and beyond, draw those chalk lines to hopefully satisfy one more concern that you guys had, and we are willing to further compromise with you in a way that makes this safe event more possible. Thank you. Uh, is the other person there with you, or are they... Uh... She's on the phone. Oh, okay. She's on the phone with you, or... Okay. If she wants to go next. Um, I'm, here at my own, I'm here at my own house. I just wanted to um, point out one more thing that Adrian and I didn't touch on, which was um, the question about whether or not we were shutting down people's ideas on our Facebook page. I have not seen any comments about 
posting the mass barbecue at the Red Grove or at the City Grove or the City Park. I haven't seen any mentions of people planning to bring alcohol or us asking people to bring alcohol because we're not involved in any barbecue. Um, so I'd just like for if you do send a letter, that to be redacted from it because that's simply not true. And it's, I've never seen that anywhere, and I read every comment on that page. So thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Hey Jerry, this is um, this is Andrew Hotsport. Go ahead, Andrew. Hey, uh, <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to jump on, and you know, I, I, I uh, I'm coming at this from a little bit uh, outsider's perspective. I do follow the <clears throat> the Fourth of July parade um, page on Facebook. I've interacted it, with it at all. I did make some social media posts on the World Span page community. Before I was even aware of this page about saying, "Hey, why don't why don't we have a group of people that just kind of celebrate their independence going through town?" Um, you know, that's gonna for me personally, that would happen in my vehicle. I'd put some American flags up on um, my truck, and I just you know celebrate our independence because we don't have the liberty of the um, <clears throat> the frontier days putting on the parade, which is something that I religiously attend as I'm. Uh, since I've been back in town in Willett. Um, I am what some, somewhat surprised that the city would take a stance against the parade. I, I do I do understand that they have, you know, responsibility or, or uh, liability, I guess, for things that they promote or allow for. Um, but, uh, but I don't really see the need as a community member to um, take a staunch stance against um, people that are trying to do the right thing. Now, <clears throat> with respect to comments that people make on social media, we're all aware of this. There are people that just say the most outrageous things that don't go along with the administrator's um, intentions and to um, infer that they may potentially be doing things that they're not going to be doing is challenging. I do I do respect that there could be things hap that happen at this at this event that um, that don't uh, don't prescribe to what their wants or needs are, they don't have security. It is going to be someone unorganized. Um, <clears throat> I more so think of this thing as people are going to show up and, and celebrate their independence and hopefully get cheered by other people in their vehicles that support that same ideology. Whether that's a Trump flag or a Biden flag or a or a BLM flag, I mean, I, I don't really care. Everybody has their own perspective, and that's, I think that's something to be celebrated about America and about our independence. Um, <clears throat> so I just, uh, you know, I, 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 I think that the city taking a stance against this isn't really appropriate um, or making a formal perspective and drafting a letter and taking the, 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 the time of the city staff to, to be able to do this is, is just unneeded. Um, you know, I am aware that they did allow that. They called it a promenade, or a, so they didn't call it a celebration or a parade because we know that those aren't allowed. Um, they did allow for and um, and support that, and, and I've heard the staff um, talking about that specifically, and so why they would allow that and not this 4th of July, which the, um, the individuals have already indicated as, uh, as kind of... Uh, it's kind of awkward um, from an outsider's perspective. So um, I would say, you know, hopefully these people do what they're supposed to do, just like the, the Black Lives Matter protest people did. Um, there was also another um, rally um, in, in Bathbrook Park, and I think that they tried to do what they were supposed to. I think everybody's trying to do what they're supposed to be doing. I've just been told by Kathy it's time. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next person, would you like to speak? State your name. Going? You ready? All right. I'm gonna bring I did, back up. I did receive a um, some communications from the public. If you, you want me to, um, I did receive a um, a note from and a phone call from a Nancy Wheeler who 
was going to try to get on the phone. She was extremely upset about this event. She says she owns property in the area, and she was very concerned about um, this event and thought it was a it was a very dangerous thing to do. I also received a letter from Willits Frontier Days, who wrote a letter saying, Willits Frontier Days is informed that an ad hoc group is proposing to gather in the park to commence a parade on July 4th. Although Frontier Days has agreements with the city of Willits, we want to emphasize that any such activities are not sponsored by Willits Frontier Days and any outside agreements that we have with the city. Again, Willits Frontier Days renews its appreciation for the cooperation by the city of Willits with Frontier Days dating back almost 100 years. Okay. All right. Uh, at this point, I'll bring it back up to the council. So... Again, uh, start again with Mary. Did you have anything? Um, I have nothing. Madge? Yeah, um, I, I do understand that the, you know, the state rules exempt um, protests or religious gatherings, um, subject also still to the restrictions on um, social distancing and masks as well. Um, and I'm, I'm familiar that at least uh, one or two of the gatherings that have happened at Babcock Park uh, did practice social distancing and wore masks. Um, the history of the parade uh, is that there's been literally thousands of people and with any, even a third of those numbers or you know, a fourth of those numbers, uh, social distancing might simply not be practical and therefore it could uh, create a really dangerous um, reading ground for spreading the virus. And that would affect not just the people that attend, but everybody else in the community because they all interact. We, you know, we all inter we're all in this together, as somebody pointed out. Um, so I, I do have a really serious concern that despite the best intentions of the promoters of this uh, alternative parade, it could get out of hand in terms of the numbers of people, in terms of really um, observing all of the safety protocols that would help protect the community from the potential adverse effects. So I, I think a letter is in order that, uh, that basically discourages anything that comes close to that kind of a mass gathering. And, it, and again, the promoters may not have any control over that. Um, people find out there's some kind of parade happening and they'll show up and may or may not bring booze and may or may not bring masks and may or may not do social distancing. Um, I, I think we could tone down a couple of the statements because it does sound to me like the promoters of this are are trying to be observant, but I think if we if we say that this could be a mass gathering which could in fact endanger the community and we really discourage that and it runs the risk not only of the public health impact but also of perhaps reversing some of the opening of uh, the community that we've been able to to achieve and and put our city funds from the state you know there's a lot of risk that the city and that all of the community members um, are exposed to by this this potentially um, out of, it could get out of hand event. So I, I guess I I think um, we should write a letter and say that this this verges on or could become a mass gathering that would violate the law and we would really discourage um, the promotion of it for that reason. Um, and we would discourage the holding of it for that reason. Um, if they are, or some people hold this anyway, uh, that we should hold them very strictly to all of the, the public health orders so that if it is the minimum damage or risk that uh, could, could befall the community. So I, I want us to do a letter and um, I'm willing to consider minor weeks. Um, hi, this is this is Stephanie. Uh, um, I'd like to clarify something. 
Um, this is the city manager. Um, the I worked with the county and discussed this gathering at length with county and who also talked to county council. And there is no question that what is being asked for here is a mass gathering. Um, having people, even if they were to stand six feet apart, still a mass gathering. Um, there has been ample people on social media and now in the newspapers um, and now on the front page of the Ukiah paper encouraging people to come to this event. Um, this is a uh, what Dr. Duhand and the county and the state has clearly said and it was um, seconded by county council is when you invite people to this gathering it is a mass gathering and it's um, chalk lines on the street is not going to make it any less so. Uh, the and also it's like I'm now thinking, great, I need to hire, going to have to hire public works overtime to clean up those chalk lines. And but it's um, again worked with the county, worked with county council. There's no question in our minds that a, that a mass gathering is absolutely being planned. And um, so we are very concerned about that, and we are concerned about the liability of that. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you yes. for that clarification. And, and I, I haven't seen the promotion materials, uh, and you're um, adding to my level of caution about this. Thank you. Better? a lot of time on this issue. Um, I've had a lot of feedback from community members on both sides of this issue. I've talked at length with um, Adriana and I think that the original idea um, as Andrew suggested was two rows of vehicles going parallel past each other waving to each other and celebrating the 4th. In fact, I got a video from Adriana showing two lines of pickup trucks waving flags, passing each other on a beach. It was great, great idea. The problem is that when you ask people, when you tell people that there's going to be a row of vehicles a procession on Main Street, our tradition in Willits is to go to Main Street and watch the procession. And that's what everyone at the city is so afraid of, is all of those people showing up on Main Street and watching the procession. My feeling though is whether you send this letter or not, people who want to watch the procession are going to show up. We're in an absolutely no-win situation here. The city has to cover its butt by sending out a letter to say, we're off the hook, we're not liable for this, please don't do this. But the people who are going to do this are going to do it anyway. So I don't even know what to tell you here. It's the 4th of July. It's a good idea if it can be done in a safe way. But I just am not convinced it can be done in a safe way because you're asking people to watch you on Main Street. I know the city gave its tacit approval or even its explicit approval of the procession from the high school by having one of our PD be the caboose of the procession. And if you walked down to Main Street and saw the people gathered, there were a lot of people, and there were a lot of people who weren't social distancing. Um, we ended up, my husband and I ended up watching the procession on Pine Street, where there were only a couple of people on the block. Everybody was about 20 feet apart. It was great. But that's not what was happening on Main Street. I don't know the answer here, but I think this letter is aggressive in tone. I think it's going to make a lot of people in the community angry. No win. Can I just remind you that we are not calling for spectators. We really are just trying to get people organized in their cars to drive through Main Street. I know that we are going to do the talk. That is just for like time to compromise on the fucking but we really, truly just wanted to like get people in their cars to drive through the 4th of July down Main Street with their flags waving, some great country music playing probably just so these people could get out of their house that was at the time when we were originally planning this 
you know, that was exciting for people. The 4th of July is legendary, and we absolutely respect World's Frontier Days and the fact that nothing else can happen. And that's why we worked so hard to have this one thing where people could be in their cars. We even originally wanted to plan it where people would have to watch from their cars. But then we are like, low, let's just have people participate by driving. You need to stop talking. Come on. It's back up to the council at this point. You had an opportunity to speak. That's why I kind of let everybody speak. Okay, Greta, go ahead. Well, do I get rebuttals later? No, we're community members. We don't get rebuttals. So the, the point is, is that it's great that you're not asking people to line up on Main Street, but the reality is, is that in Willits, when there's a procession on Main Street, we line up. That's who we are. It's what we do. It's our Main Street. So, you know, unless you've actually like specifically said to people, do not go stand and watch this procession on Main Street, the city's going to freak out. So that's what's happening here. I mean, the city is asking for your help to not be liable for bad stuff that could happen. And you all have been so great about trying to figure out a safe way to do it. But I think what is becoming clear as the cases rise is people are afraid there is no safe way to do this right now. And that's why Frontier Days canceled, because they couldn't get a safe way to do this. So I feel your pain. I want a 4th of July. I, was, I rode my bicycle last year in the 4th of July parade. I want to do it again. But this year, right now, in the middle of this, it just doesn't seem smart. I'm done. At this point... Now, Sabrina. Oh boy. Um, I I agree with some of the points that were made. I know that uh, as a as a city council member, we have an obligation to be fair, um, but we also have an obligation to protect the city, and we also have an obligation to um, ensure that our citizens um, feel safe and anything we can do to protect their their health. Um, because of because of the last one at health and safety, I do believe that we should issue the letter um, because we need to protect the city. Um, I'd like to make a motion that if we strike the word blatant from the second paragraph and we strike the word your in the sentence that says your proposed celebration and just put A in its place. And then in the last sentence where it says uh, we don't support your actions, if you could change that to mass gatherings are not supported by the city or county, um, my motion would be to approve that. And my reason for that being is that, uh, like I said, we have to protect the city and I, I, I do believe, like Greta said, that there will still be something, and I have mixed feelings on that. I am concerned about people gathering on Main Street. Um, fortunately, the parade or procession route that the high school used um, winded through the, the communities, which allowed people like myself we, um, the ability to stay in my own front yard and not, not gather at all. But we did allow these things. Uh, to happen in our community, and regardless of what people choose to uh, protest or show pride in, whether it be Black Lives Matter or Fourth of July or whatnot, um, or what or what my political leanings are, uh, fairness is always uh, at, at the top of my mind, and and I don't think that we should write this letter in a, in a way that is aggressive or accusatory, but rather just simply mass gatherings are not allowed. So you have a motion before you. Do I have a motion? motion? Another motion. I will second the motion. Can you clarify exactly what the motion is? Sure. I'll read where you want it. Yeah, sure. So, uh, let me get back to the to the document here. If you go to the second paragraph of the letter, 
you will find the word, sorry, looking for it really quick. Um, it'll say the word blatant. Line six. Um, sorry, my, line six. Line six, thank you. If you could just strike that word, because I think it's an accusatory and aggressive word, all I'm asking you to do is strike that word. And then in the third paragraph, if you could strike the word your, your in the sentence that says your proposed celebration and just say a celebration. Is that part clear? Yes. Yes. Oh. And then in the in the then the very last sentence of this document says neither the state nor the county supports your actions. I feel like that sentence is very vague because we're implying that their actions are not within the, the scope of what is allowed by law, and we don't really, we don't truly know whether they are. So I just rather like to keep it very factual and change the wording to say mass gatherings are not supported by the city or the county. I, I don't support mass gatherings. So. So for the three changes in my motion. Uh, this is definitely a point of clarification. Would it work if it said, so look for the last sentence, neither the city nor the county support mass gathering? Okay, thank you. I will, and I will amend my motion to that particular wording. And I agree on my second of the motion, agree to that. As, you know, uh, before I call for the vote, I just want to say that I agree with Greta. You know, I, you know, we all, I, I've only missed one Frontier Days parade. Frontier Days, I know they did it with a heavy heart, canceling your parade, because they couldn't ensure. Keep folks socially distanced, etc. And then speaking to the high school thing, I think what we all imagined was what they did in other communities where everybody stayed in their car is what these folks are talking about. And they drove around to the different houses and not folks in the backs of pickups and that kind of stuff. It was going to be uh, folks driving around with their cars decorated to everybody in town. They, they had a route. That's what they did in other towns. Saw it on TV. And I think, you know, the hope was they were going to follow something like that. And then people showed up out on the street. Can I just add to that too that um, that was really it was a design for our community's graduates and their families and um, the tradition quote unquote which is a long one of the Fourth of July parade has brought thousands of other people and so it is really a much more risky um, situation than that and and I also agree, agree with what Mayor Gonzalez just said I did not imagine. A, that the kids would be standing up in the pickup trucks, which was an unsafe thing to do, and that there would be um, people gathering in big clumps of people, uh, but more that it was spread out through the community. So uh, it, it really, this is a much higher risk, and it is a mass gathering, and it shouldn't be happening. We are we're experiencing a real rise in the level of, we have a doubling in eight days of the cases and we have cases in Willet. So we're on the verge of unleashing some pretty bad health impacts and this is the wrong time to be doing this. So I, I really hope that everybody will, bearing that in mind, won't go ahead with this plan. But I think the least we can do is put our concerns in this letter. And I just want to say I did take the time to call ladies in question and raise my concerns. And I, I believe they believe that what they're, they think could happen. But it's kind of like when you let the cat out of the bag. Obviously, the school district didn't do it or the uh, school folks didn't follow just the idea they should have. And what makes me think these folks aren't going to do that. I, you know, And again, I'm not pointing fingers at Ms. White or Ms. Garcia. It's, it's the genie you let out of the bottle you can't control. Okay, I'm going to bring it back up. Larry, 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 this is Larry. Yes, Larry. Uh, so what we're voting on is this changing the last section of your action to mass gatherings. 
Everything else is the same. Everything else is the same. Now, um, Sabrina, could you recap for Larry? I'm sure, Sorry. Larry. Yeah, you you got you. That's correct. The last sentence is is being changed, and then in the uh, second paragraph, Larry, I only ask to have the word blatant strike. That's all I Sabrina. need to know. Thank you very much. Uh, and then in the third paragraph, just change the word your to a. All right. Okay, at this point, Kathy, call for the vote. Yes, Councilmember Connie. With a heavy heart, yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Strong? Yes. Stransky? No. Mayor Gonzalez? Yes. Okay. And now we are off of this, and we have no... Can I just say thank you to you guys? I know that this is stressful for everybody. This is Adriana. This is stressful for everybody. I do thank you for all your time and your concern, and uh, we just hope that you guys have a really wonderful Fourth of July. Thank you, Adriana, and uh, best of luck and stay healthy, ladies. Okay. Now, at this point, we are on the consent calendar, and Kathy, you had said to strike the minutes of June tenth. So what we have on the consent calendar is the have minutes for May 13th, and then item B would be approved contract with Dave Egger, Mendocino Janitorial for Janitorial Services at the Willis Police Department, an annual amount not to exceed 19800 per year, school year 2021 and 21-22. And then item C, approved contract with Michael Serrato's Cleaning Service for Jan Janitorial Services at City Hall and Public Works Engineering Departments. Annual amount not to exceed $22,320 per year for fiscal years 2021 and 2122. And item C, resolution approving a debt service reimbursement agreement between Brook Trails Township Community Service District, the City of Lawrence. And item E, resolution approving an agreement with Mendocino County Sheriff's Office for animal control services. And resolution item F, resolution authorizing continuation of municipal operations based on fiscal year 2019-20 budget. Basically, it means we're extending our current budget. Uh, get our budget since we have a new finance director. Uh, I have two questions. This is Madge. Okay. Uh, one is that I think we want the um, item about the extending the budget to go to July 8th instead of July 1st. Um, so, and I, I think that was, um, you know, we were originally going to have a meeting on July 1st, but we might not until July 8th. So that was one thing to clarify. And then I just wanted to ask Stephanie or um, whoever, would there be any savings if in the future we had one janitorial service that did both City Hall and the Public Works Engineering and so forth. Um, what, why do, do we have two different ones? Um, I can speak to, let me speak to the continuation of municipal operations first. This is Stephanie Gerberts here. Um, the, I actually spoke to the finance director today. He was here all day today. Um, unfortunately, he is driving back tonight, and he's going through some dead zones. So if he doesn't chime in, it's because he's in a dead zone. Um, we've had some uh, a lot of talks in the budget, and we want to make sure that the finance committee gets the chance to see the draft budget before it gets to council. So he actually asked that um, just in case we can't get it done by the 8th, that we make this resolution for the 15th, um, just in case. <laughs> And we can't get a budget to you before the 15th, but it won't be after that. Um, as for the janitorial service, these are historical contracts. And I would ask that the deputy city manager chime in about these because there's a, a history with uh, both janitorial services. I would rather uh, speak to that. I could speak to the PD one. Mike, Kathy? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, Basically, anybody we have over at the police department has to be backgrounded. And so it's not just a matter of, you know, I guess if we put it out and the individual needed to be backgrounded. So it, it's, 
there's a level of trust and as far as operating around some of the materials over there and uh, as far as passing a Department of Justice background. So that's why it's always, it's, it's kind of like once you have a gem for you, you kind of stick with it uh, unless something changes. Larry? This is Larry. Go ahead. I, would like, I would like to pull E. Okay. Item E, resolution, uh, Sheriff's Department. Okay, and Kathy, did you want to speak to the other one? or? Oh, I just wanted to say that um, in speaking to both the janitorial services, they are happy with where they're at. Neither one of them wants to take on the other project. So, I have tried in the past. So, um, I'll move approval of the uh, consent calendar minus uh, item E that we're pulling. What? And minus the minutes that we're pulling. All right. And do I have a second? Council members, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Motion second. Any further discussion? Yes. Yeah. the budget? <laughs> what? Sabrina, go ahead. Okay. This is Sabrina. I just have a question. As I, I just want to make sure I understood it correctly, um, that there is, that this was a budgeted item. We're not over budget. That's how I read it. Is that, is that correct? Which item? Uh, I'm sorry. The two janitorial items. Yes. Yes, they are within budget. Okay. They haven't asked, they, neither of them have asked for any increases. Okay, that's how I read it. I just want to make sure I understood. That's all. Okay, anybody from the public that would like to speak on items on the consent? Hearing none, I bring it back up. And if I could get a vote on the consent items, Kathy? Councilmember Connie? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Strong? Yes. Stransky? Yes. Mayor Gonzalez. Yes. So for item E, it's the uh, agreement with the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office for Animal Control Services. Also, if you'll notice, our sheriff is present. But uh, Larry, you asked for this before, so you obviously have a question. So I'll... I have a question, and I voted no on this all the time because the sheriff's office does not come out early in the morning any time in the year or the two years that this contract is on and it's been going for a long time and my thing is that if you walk in the morning people just kick their dogs loose and let them run and i've complained about this for 15 years and nothing has happened thank you very much i have the sheriff here you want to speak to this well we had a similar issue in mendocino of them I believe it was last year, and uh, I can speak with of animal control. Perhaps we can change those work hours. Uh, we have a young man from uh, Willits who is applied with us as an animal control officer, and if we need to change some of those hours, we certainly can, uh, especially with the young man living there. Um, hopefully, we should have him uh, trained up and ready to go sometime in the next couple of months. But uh, if we need to change those hours, I'm sorry, I haven't heard those complaints in the past. I know that we've made some adjustments previously. I'm certain that we can make some adjustments. This is Larry again. I, I have complained about this and voted no on it for 15 years, and I can't believe you haven't heard something about it. And if we can have one day out of the month that he comes around early in the morning, like at sunup to you know, for a couple, two or three hours, that would be great. And that's what I've all I've been asking for. Larry, I'm certain that we can, I'm certain that we can meet those needs. And I'm, I'll apologize to you. Uh, I've only been the sheriff for six months, and therefore I probably didn't hear about it before now, but we can jump on it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Anybody else on the council? Yeah, yeah Sheriff Kendall, this, this is Council Member Sabrina Rodriguez. Could, could you tell me if, what, how many hours is somebody currently serving our city what, on a weekly basis? I can go in and look, look at the times. We had, uh, when our, Angela was working for us, we had several hours a uh, week in there. 
currently the uh, contract calls for six hours, I believe six hours a week. I'm, I'm scrolling through it now. Um, but I could check the, uh, or I could get the uh, animal control lieutenant to check the hours because we are billing them by location. Six hours a week is correct. For a total of 312? Correct. Okay. Any other questions, Sabrina? I was, sorry, I was quickly, quickly doing the math. No other questions. Any questions? Oh, I was doing the math too. We were. <laughs> All right. It's approximately $70 per hour, Greta. <laughs> Madge? Okay, Madge's waving. She has no questions. I just want to explain to everybody that if there's a certain level of. Uh, Reporting that has to happen, somebody gets bit by a dog. Um, there's some reports that the state gets that animal control sends in, and uh, that, that's a little time consuming. It's kind of something within something they train up to do when they go to their animal control training. Am I correct, Chair? Yes, and also um, out of that $22,000, that's not all salary. Uh, we have vehicle mileage, we have um, fuel costs, um, and, you know, it's a weighted rate for an employee. And uh, the weighted rate for most employees nowadays with the A87 costs and, uh, and various other things, for every dollar that we give one of these young men or young ladies who works for us, it's normally costing the county somewhere about a buck sixty-five to a dollar eighty. And so... Um, I'm, I'm certain we could hire a lot of animal control officers if we did pay them $70 an hour. But when we break all of that down, a lot of it goes to vehicle mileage, vehicle replacement costs, fuel, and things like that. Uh, just to clarify, okay. everybody, we also end up uh, paying uh, county shelter for animals that make it in there. So that's, that's something else that uh, the Sheriff's Department doesn't uh, bill us we a separate billing with the county. This is Katrina. I just, I'd like to clarify that although I did the math and it was $70 an hour as a business owner, I was already thinking in my head that within that $70, you have payroll, you have mileage, you have many other costs. So that wasn't meant at all as an insult. It was just simply me running the numbers. No, no, I understand. And thank you. It's, and I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to explain. But any other questions? Otherwise, I'll see if anybody from the public would like to ask any questions about this. Okay. I will call for a motion on this item. I'll move approval <laughs> of that, um, item 5E. I'll second. For the discussion? All right. Uh, call for the vote. Councilmember Connie? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Strong? Yes. Stransky? Yes. Mayor Gonzalez? Yes. Thank you, Sheriff, for being here. Go no right. Just to the fact that Larry Stransky has voted no on this every year. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a milestone. He's voted yes. Thank you. Well, Larry, please send me an email. Let me know what days I need to get uh, these young folks up there, and we'll get that taken care of for you. Thank you. Any day of the month. That, and that's all I ask, because there are people that walk early in the morning because it's cool and it's the time that they can do it, and there's not anybody ever out from the animal control. Absolutely nobody. And so when people kick their dogs loose and, you know, let them roam out to find a spot to do their job, uh, they're angry. And so you have to be chased up and down the block. I understand. We will jump on it. We will take care of it. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. All right, folks, we are now on item six, information reports, and they're available on the website that Solid Waste provided us an annual disclosure statement, the operations report, and then annual reports. And item seven, now going to convene as the planning commission. The city council um, meets currently as the city planning commission and uh, city 
the successor agency right now will be sitting as the planning commission discuss possible action on application of major subdivision SE-19-01 for Demport Enterprises. This will be a dusty thing. It will. Thank you, Mayor. Dusty Dooley, Community Development Director. Good evening. Hello, Council Members. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation for you, and I believe um, I'll, I'll be able to take over the screen here in just a minute. I just would like to report that I am turning the screen over to Dusty, so he will have total control at the moment. Seeing out of the outer limits. Okay, Dusty. Are, are, uh, Mayor, are you seeing my screen right now? Which is uh, which the first slide? Yes. Wow, well, Kathy, we did it. Well, we're Yay. off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, tonight, uh, uh, before the council, is um, uh, a project to your consideration. It's a, a major subdivision, case number SD-1901 for, for the applicant, BEMCOR Enterprises. Um, uh, before, I, before I get started, um, uh, I, I did get uh, two letters um, from the public. Uh, you have uh, one letter from uh, Mr. Dan Miller, who is a adjacent property owner to the, to the project site. Uh, he lives at 1465 Willow Lane. Uh, and he noted his uh, main concern with the project was, was water drainage uh, and recognized that there, there is um, a small creek across the lot and provides drainage for, for the property. Um, and also his second concern was uh, related to the fact that there's conceptual plans showing a two-story fourplex building that would be located just outside the south property line adjacent to his dining room window. Uh, and so he does have concerns related to um, privacy. I also received a letter, or excuse me, an email uh, dated June 18th uh, from Mr. Eric Glassy um, uh, representing the Willis Charter School, which is uh, another adjacent property owner to the, to the project. Uh, and he requested that the uh, applicant put up some sort of uh, privacy hedge fence or other visual barriers so residents can't stare onto our field uh, while students are exercising. It would be good to have it at a minute eight feet high, but if it was planting, we could wait a couple years for it to grow high and wide enough to create a visual barrier. Uh, the council also should have within their packets the uh, agenda summary staff report the uh, initial study for the project, uh, as well as a resolution which the, uh, with the recommended conditions uh, by staff. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and get started. Um, this, uh, I'm on slide two. We have Council Member Larry Stransky at, at, at home that's not on the computer. And so I want to make sure to, to call out the numbers uh, on, the, on the slide so that, that he and anyone else can, can follow along. So. On, on slide number two, it includes the applicant submitted uh, vesting tentative map. It shows the uh, eight. Uh, it shows the the projects proposing to create ten lots um, with conceptual plans for uh, single family homes to be built on eight of the lots and four complexes to be built on lots nine and ten. So a total of, of twenty four units when you consider the eight single family homes and the and the four fourplexes. Uh, you also see uh, the proposed access road extending south from, from Bechtel Road. On slide three, uh, just simply showing you uh, the location of the project relative to the city boundaries. Uh, the project is located on the south of Bechtel Road um, near its intersection with, with Willow Lane. On, on slide four, uh, uh, staff is is uh, showing the, the zoning for the property as well as the adjacent properties. The, the subject property is zoned R2, uh, and uh, the majority of the surrounding lands uh, share that zoning, uh, but we also have a, a mixture of, of C2, our heavy commercial zoning, um, in the area as well. The, the general plan states the intent of the, of the medium residential, the R2 district, and uh, it's 
The classification is for the application to limited areas of mixed density residential uses or new development areas most suitable for duplexes, multifamily, apartment, or professional office uses where all urban services are available and where schools, parks, community facilities, etc., are in convenient proximity. So that, that is the intent of the zoning. And then I will mention that single family homes and fourplexes that the applicant shows in their conceptual plans are permitted uses in the R2 zoning. The discretionary action that's in front of the council for consideration is the actual subdivision of the land. Moving on to slide five, uh, we have an aerial view of the, of the project site. The property boundaries are approximately outlined in the white lines there. You can see uh, Bechtel Road to your north. Uh, you can see the residence, the single family homes to the east and north of the property that are accessed by Willow Lane. Uh, and then to the west, you have a, a mixture of land uses um, starting at the north at Bechtel Road. Uh, you have a, a number of single family homes. Uh, then uh, to the south of that, you can see the Willis Charter School, including the, um, the soccer field, which was uh, subject to the privacy request uh, of the school to, to put up some sort of visual barrier. Uh, and then if you continue south, uh, you have, uh, again, some, uh, some commercial businesses uh, that include the uh, 101 trailer repair and Peterson tractor businesses. So again, there is a, a decent mixture of, of land uses uh, in the area. The, the property is currently vacant. Um, I, I do see in the, the southwest corner that there is a building. I believe that that building has been removed. Um, the, the property does sit currently vacant. There, there has been a history of other land uses on this property. In speaking to the property owner and, and other um, elders in the community, this property used to support a mixture of single family homes and duplexes. Uh, it was served by a, a 30 foot wide road known as Crest Lane. Um, and uh, there was also a corner store vegetable stand that was located on the property uh, at Bechtel Road. Um, uh, the, the, for, for what it's worth, uh, those buildings were condemned and were demolished uh, by the property owners sometime in the, in the 60s. Uh, there was also a subdivision that occurred in 1985 that created the subject parcel, uh, although no development did occur as a result of that subdivision. Um, I'm moving on to slide six just to show you the, the setting of the property. These are recent photos of the property subject to the subdivision. Uh, this is uh, looking, um, uh, looking uh, facing south. there. Again, this is a, another picture of the property uh, facing north towards Bechtel Road. Uh, this is the, the existing driveway that currently serves the, the, uh, the project that would uh, be improved. Um, again, just another picture facing north. Um, picture facing southeast showing uh, the vegetation around the, the drainage ditch slash creek that's referenced uh, throughout the, the staff report and initial study. Uh, these are the, the closest neighbors to the subdivision. This is uh, a picture being taken from the vantage point of the proposed access road looking at um, two of the existing single family homes on Willow Lane. Again, this is a, a, a picture facing west. Uh, this, this would likely be from a vantage point of one of the single family homes uh, that's shown on the conceptual um, plans. And this is, I believe, the, um, the play area that's referenced by Mr. Glassy in, in his letter to, to staff, uh, where he's requesting um, some type of landscaping or fencing to, uh, to increase privacy uh, for the kids when they're, when they're playing in this area. Uh, we did include just a, a quick slide showing some potential ideas. We could take advantage of the existing fence and, and create some type of vegetation that would grow up and, and, and maybe meet to the satisfaction of, of the school. Um, that's just one idea. And, and in talking to the applicant, he's aware of the request from the school district and has, has stated that you know he's willing to work with the school district to come up with an amiable solution there. Um, I will mention that 
uh, any landscaping that's installed as part of the project would be expected to be uh, maintained um, by the by the property owner. Um, one of the key issues with this project is the fact that the property is located within our earthquake fault zone uh, due to its proximity to the Mayakama fault zone. Uh, staff did require that a uh, fault rupture analysis be completed uh, as part of the, the review. That, that study determined that the fault is not actually located on the property, um, which is certainly good news for the development potential. Um, however, uh, because it is in the fault study, state law still requires that a geotechnical report uh, be completed prior to any development on the property. So again, this is just an additional safeguard been identified by the state of California uh, that recognizes there may be some additional construction requirements beyond standard building code requirements that should go into place. And this is a study that will inform those future construction designs. Um, and then I'm now going to go on to slide 14. I hope. So another key issue that's discussed um, throughout the staff report and initial study is the, um, the subdivision access road and, and, and design standards. Uh, you can see that the preferred access road would come on to, to Bechtel Road. The access road would, would only serve uh, the, the, the subdivision itself. Uh, there are no other uh, adjoining properties or future land uses identified that would be served by the access road. Um, we did show that the, the entrance on the Bechtel Road is about 525 feet east of its intersection with North Main Street and about 240 uh, seven feet uh, west of uh, Bechtel Road's intersection with Willow Lane and Shell Lane. And, and the reason why staff showed this to you is Bechtel Road, um, according to the Willis Police Department, as well as locals living in the area that have complained this, to the city in the past, is you have um, a high number of folks that don't obey the speed limit on Bechtel Road. It's a posted speed limit of, of 35 miles an hour um, and um, there certainly is a concern about being able to safely pull out of the access road, recognizing um, that folks can be traveling at, at speeds beyond what they should be. Um, staff has talked about a number of ideas to try to slow traffic down at that location. Um, you know, any ideas that we do come up with would need to be supported by a traffic study. I, I wrote in the report that you know, since the, the issue is primarily due to the folks speeding, um, it wasn't obvious that, that the applicants should share the cost and any improvements that are identified or even the traffic study itself. Um, rather, it's an existing um, issue um, that, that staff is, has on our radar to, to address. Um, solutions could be something as stream as a, a four-way stop at Willow Lane on Bechtel Road where, Will, where it intersects with Willow Lane and, um, and Shell Lane. Um, less, um, it, some easier potential solutions might be, um, you know, putting some additional signage up, um, certainly having more enforcement in the area or, or some other sort of traffic calming um, improvement. Uh, now I'm on to slide 15. Uh, this is showing the, the city standards for what the proposed access road uh, typically would be required of the proposed access road, excuse me, uh, and that includes a 56-foot wide right-of-way to include two 10-foot tra uh, travel lanes, a 7-foot parking lane, a 6-foot sidewalk, and then a 5-foot area on the back of the sidewalk for, for um, typically for public utilities. Uh, what the applicant is requesting is an exception to that standard uh, and to rather uh, complete improvements within a 45-foot right-of-way. Um, th this would include the, the two 10-foot travel lanes and the seven-foot foot parking lane on either side. Uh, where the, what the exception would include is that they would only, that the applicant is requesting to only install a six-foot sidewalk on the east side of the road and not on the west side of the road and to install a five-foot um, 
five foot strip of land on the on the west side, um, but not on the the east side. So again, uh, this is the standard uh, that you typically would that the city would require for this type of access road, and and this um, next slide is showing the the deviation um, from from the standard. Uh, the applicant um, had lengthy discussions with our staff, including uh, our contract city engineer, and staff determined that, that this conditional right-of-way was adequate to serve this, the subdivision, recognizing that, uh, the, it, the, that no other land uses uh, have legal access to this road, and uh, it does, there doesn't appear, appear to be any future development that would, uh, would, would rely on this road in the future. And for those reasons, um, staff was okay with recommending that, that this, this conditional right-of-way is adequate to serve the subdivision. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. If it's okay with the mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, to confirm that five-foot strip would actually be between the, can, the potential road and the charter school. Is that correct? Or what's on that side? That, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No that was the same question I had. So I, I mentioned uh, previously that there was a subdivision completed in 1985 that created the subject parcel. As part of that subdivision, there was a 60-foot wide um, access uh, uh, right-of-way that was, was given to the city. Um, the applicant... Um, as mentioned previously, it is requesting that the standard right-of-way be reduced to 45 feet and that the additional uh, approximately 15 feet of the, of the right-of-way um, uh, be merged into the proposed, for the, be merged into the pr proposed lots one through eight uh, to increase the, the size of those lots. The, the main benefit of, of vacating that portion of the road to the property owner is is to allow for a, an additional one or two lots to be created. It also creates bigger lots, which would certainly be you know beneficial to any, any future um, folks that, that choose to buy a property there. Uh, but that but that's essentially what the trade off is. Uh, you do have the zoning district calls for a minimum parcel size of six thousand square feet, um, and um, if uh, if the city didn't wasn't um, willing to grant the the 15 foot it, it would uh, reduce the the total number of single family lots from eight to seven and, and possibly and possibly six and so what this slide number 17 is trying to show is um, essentially the, the 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 land that would be vacated for the benefit of proposed lots one through eight I have a question too um, this is Madge that uh Towards the north end near Bechtel, um, there are, I think, three houses that, that front on this new, uh, newly uh, proposed frontage road. And th at the moment, they're parking along there. Uh, will this reduced right-of-way um, allow them to continue to do that? Or is that going to block traffic? Well, uh, those uh, those vehicles that you can see there are not they're parked in the, the city right away. Um, there will be parking on that side of the street, um, and even though they don't live in the subdivision, I don't know what would stop them from parking there. Okay, so it doesn't impinge on the travel lanes um, for for people to park on that side on the west side of the street up there. Is that right? Uh, that, that's correct. There'll be a seven foot wide parking lane uh, about right where those cars. And, and hey, this, is, this is Jeremy Ronco, project manager. Can I just jump in and oh, I just sure. wanted to, to uh, confirm. Yeah, if, if we, they're offering this for dedication. So if we accept it, it would just become like a, a city street. Um, anybody can park there basically not just the subdivision. Thank, thank you, Jeremy, and, and, and please keep chiming in as you see fit. Uh, but moving on to slide 18, 
Well, this this probably was uh, not in the right order, but this is the actual final map that was uh, that was recorded for the previous uh, minor land division uh, number eighty five dash three, and it shows the the parcel A, which is the sixty foot wide easement that was dedicated to the city as part of uh, as part of that subdivision. Um, moving on to slide nineteen. Um, the one of the main concerns that staff had with this project was um, was its impact to the existing drainage facilities that that serve this area of town. Um, what staff um, has tried to do with with this exhibit is um, is identify with the blue line the approximate location of the drainage improvements, um, and then uh, you have uh, numbers one through five showing the vantage points for um, the different photos that staff um, took to to try to help showcase uh, what the current drainage situation is uh, for this property. Um, so, uh, photo number one there on the top left is, is, show, is, is shot from the actual property and it's showing the, the uh, drainage channel uh, as it currently exists. Uh, you can, I didn't get a great picture of the drainage channel due to the high level of vegetation that was growing around it, uh, but you can see it's a, a natural area um, um, and, and acts as the drainage facility for a number of properties in the area. Uh, photo number two was taken. Um, that is showing a a vault, a, a, a box culvert that is uh, that goes underneath Bethel Road. Um, and actually, that's not right. That's actually photo number three showing the box culvert going under um, under Bechtel Road. Uh, oh, these all got renumbered wrong. Okay. Uh, photo five, I'm sorry, is actually photo two, and that sh that does show a little bit better the, the, the natural drainage channel that, that provides the, the stormwater drainage for the property. Uh, the, after going under Bechtel Road, uh, the um, drainage is, is underground. Uh, but it does get exposed uh, near Shell Lane, uh, which is uh, photo number, well, three is actually four. And uh, again, you can, you can see where that drainage comes out at. And then photo number four is actually photo number five. Again, I'm sorry. Uh, and that shows some of the existing um, drainage improvements for the area. Eventually, if you follow that blue line out, you'll notice that the drainage ends up uh, near the railroad tracks, uh, where there's some open drainage ditches that eventually convey the stormwater to uh, Bechtel Creek to the north. Um, you know, depending on who you talk to, those drainage channels uh, can um, be inadequate during um, bigger flood events. Um, but um, and there's a concern from the neighbors that that this project and the increased stormwater runoff that would result from the creation of the parking lot, the road, the, uh, the new buildings um, could uh, cause um, some downstream flooding issues for the existing residences and businesses. Uh, I do want to note that as with any subdivision, uh, you are required to provide improvement plans. And one of the things that the improvement plans need to, need to address is is down, down, downstream drainage and, uh, and on-site drainage. And if you look at condition number, condition number 17, uh, it states that a drainage study prepared by a California registered civil engineer shall be submitted for review with the initial submittal of the improvement plans. The report shall include hydraulic and <clears throat> hydrologic and hydraulic calculations, narrative, and exhibits to support the des design and sizing of all public and private drainage facilities, including storm drains and detention facilities. The, the report shall address existing downstream storm drain facilities and hydraulic conditions, which may impact the design of proposed facilities and for improvements. Um, it, it's not clear to staff that when that study comes back, uh, the applicant isn't going to need to complete some on-site improvements to uh, to, to balance out the, 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 the stormwater uh, improvements there. Uh, so for instance, the applicant, and I'll go to slide 
21 here. Um, the applicant, well, and this is just a, a tuple graph showing that the, the project's relatively flat. Um, and then uh, slide 22 is showing uh, preliminary utility and grading plans. And uh, it shows that the applicant is, is going to be directing uh, all drainage from the property to this um, uh, open drainage area that, that we've been showing you photos of. This is just some examples of low impact development uh, that the applicant uh, may need to install on site. And this will be based on the results of the hydrological study. Um, but you can see there are solutions out there. This is showing a number of rain cart gardens, bioswales, where essentially you're retaining stormwater on site so that it only slowly gets released. Uh, and the, um, the, the stormwater conveyance system um, will have a, a better chance of, of not becoming overly um, saturated. The... Um, here. I think that I, I do have some other slides depending on the types of questions that come up, but um, I think that does conclude my um, initial presentation to the council. I will note, Mayor, that I do believe we have one of the applicants, Mr. Ed Mitchell, online with us, and, and he may wish to uh, address the, the council. Mr. Mitchell, if you're present, if you'd like to address the council on this. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, I can, sir. Go ahead. Actually, I, I don't have anything to add. I think uh, Dusty and staff have done a good, good job on uh, presenting this, and um, I'm available for questions, but I really have nothing that I could add. Thank you. So uh, at this point, I'll call on Larry. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I have two questions. The first one is the seismic zone. Um, I talked to Dusty and I gave him a, a batch of questions and he pretty much answered them for me. But the question of the seismic, seismic is uh, troubling to me because when we sign off on this, we're saying that the seismic is not going to happen even though that people say that it won't happen. But it's in the zone and I'm very concerned about that and the other one that I'm concerned with is the access to Willow Lane because it butts up to the property and it looks like to me other than a tree that would be real easy just to make it uh, a turnaround and where the people are parked and come right out um, Willow Lane and those are the really two big concerns that I have um, and I talked to Dusty about it and he said that that both of those have been handled and that um, that everything will be okay and I said okay so um, but I want the council to be definitely aware of the seismic lane thank you very much <coughs> uh, match um, I think Dusty's done a fantastic job of uh, evaluating this and presenting it and I don't, and I was out there uh, today just to see the site in person, and um, it it didn't seem to present any other problems. Are we? Are they going to preserve some of that nice riparian looking vegetation and the really big trees there? Is that part of the uh, sort of beyond the where the four four plexes are going to go? Is that going to be preserved? Uh, this, this is Dusty. The riparian vegetation is protected, and as far as um, whether or not the trees are going to be removed or not, it's not shown on the tentative map, but the, um, the project applicant may, may be able to provide a better answer. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Um, we do not anticipate developing anything uh, east of the creek, which where the trees uh, currently currently exist. That's actually going to be, we're going to try to clear out some of the poison oak and blackberries and make that a uh, recreational type area. Okay, then I have a question for Kathy. How do I get the number of people back on my screen? Uh, <laughs> I only have, 
have four people on my screen and uh, we yeah. still have the screen share. Correct. You can't at the moment because Dusty has his presentation up. Okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to answer Madge at the very top of your screen. Um, it says view everyone or view person talking. If you click on those double arrows, it will change what you're seeing at the very top of Des Dusty's presentation. Um, regarding the actual matter before us, um, one quick question. Um, so this, the proposed street there, uh, Dusty, you mentioned would be dedicated to city, so it would become a city street that we would be then responsible for maintaining, just like our other streets. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so then is the idea that um, eight plus new households will create enough economic activity to offset the cost to the city of maintaining a new street? And then, uh, and then you would want to add in the four fourplexes and those additional 16 units, so 24 in total. Uh, okay. And and, 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 and yeah, that would be part of the cost-benefit analysis, correct? Okay. Alrighty. Um, and then is there, so I noticed that the, um, the building we've done in phases with the single-family homes done first and then eventually the fourplexes, is there any timeline, is there any um, assurance that the city gets that those fourplexes will ultimately be built or, or when? The... Um, the applicant would, would need to talk to us about any um, known dates as far as when the phases of development would occur. Um, and, you know, certainly we have the ability and it, it's written in the report that uh, we wouldn't, uh, the final map to actually legally create the subdivision lots would not be improved until he completed all the improvements, including road improvements, uh, sewer water extension, stormwater conveyance, all of that stuff was was uh, was uh, built to the city's satisfaction, uh, which would then create the lots. But I suppose if the economy tanked or something changed, there isn't anything necessarily guaranteeing that those houses would be built. Do we have any concerns about that? Yes, the concern would be we're paying to maintain a road that's not supporting any development. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Sabrina? Sure. I'm glad to see a housing project before us. Um, I'd, before I go into my other ones, I'd like to just piggyback a little bit on Greta's uh, comment is there any kind of provision that is written in or that the city could explore in terms of ensuring that the rest of that development is uh finished because uh because we are looking at the potential for a liability in maintaining the city street so that's question one do i answer that before i move on um I suppose if it was the council's desire, you could um, we could condition the project in such a fashion that the um, the city's um, willingness to uh, take over responsibility for the road was contingent on the a certain number of units being built. That would be fair, in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Jesse. I'll move on to the to the next item. The I believe it was five feet on the west side of that proposed street. Um, if I remember correctly, it would be a not paved. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It would just be left open for future improvements. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm not so much concerned about it being paved. Um, but rather, uh, what uh, kind of plan uh, will be built in to make sure that it's not unsightly or it's not a five-foot row of weeds or, you know what I mean? Is there any kind of a beautification plan for for that five-foot section that will run down the street? No, there's nothing's been specifically identified to make use of that five-foot section. Uh, with with the exception that there may be some type of improvement that goes 
within that area for the benefit of privacy for the uh, school soccer field or, or recreation area. How difficult would it be to put in something, some kind of verbiage that just refers to, you know, some kind of vegetation management? Uh, it doesn't. Ha I'm not looking for anything uh, beautiful, so to speak, but rather just not a, a nuisance. I want to know that we're not maintaining that five foot section there as part of a proposed sidewalk or or, or street responsibility on the city's behalf. Okay, so what I, if I'm understanding you correct, um, what, what you're alluding to is um, putting a condition on the project that the uh, property owner um, uh, is, would be responsible for maintaining that five foot strip uh, free and clear of debris and weeds uh, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, I think you've it up. Um, my next question um, doesn't isn't necessarily um, a condition, but rather uh, something that I would like to see in relationship to this. Uh, so, for example, I have concerns about the fact that there's no signal on Main Street, and that as development continues to grow on the southeast side of. Uh, of Main Street, uh, that we don't have a, a light right there. And I was looking at the amount of traffic that it will increase, and not just this project, but we have a new hospital over there. And, and I don't want to make it a condition, but I would like to know that the city is actively working with Caltrans uh, to, to do eventually do some kind of a traffic study um, that would encourage some kind of traffic control um, for the people who live uh, to the southeast side of the city. Yes, your uh, your concern is noted, and, and, and may I speak to that a little bit? Sure, please. There, there have been um, traffic studies done in the area, including for the hospital project, the previous Hale Creek subdivision, as well as the recent um, um, uh, initial uh, proposal from the California Conservation Court for their facility. And, and what those um, what those traffic studies consistently show is that the um, the north end of Bechtel Road, where it comes into uh, Main Street, uh, is still providing a level of service that would not warrant um, a, an improvement such as a as a traffic light. At least based on 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 sort of that uh, tool that that's been generated and that's commonly used, and it certainly doesn't warrant a traffic light from uh, per Caltrans standard. The, where the south end of Bechtel Road comes into Main Street, that is provided, that is a level of service F. And so what the city has done in the past uh, for projects, um, discretionary projects along East Hill Road is required the um, developers to pay into a uh, traffic mitigation fee to pay a fair share of their cost towards uh, some type of improvement at uh, at Brown's Corner there, uh, where Bechtel Road comes into to Main Street Highway 20, uh, and and the most often um, cited improvement would be a, a traffic light at that location. Um, certainly, that's a costly improvement, and um, and I you know my guess would be Caltrans would be happy to to let us pay for that um, if we had the funds. Th this project is is really uh, going to increase traffic at the North Bechtel Road um, interchange, or excuse me, North Bechtel Road intersection with Main Street, and, and, and that for that reason, uh, we didn't put on that, that similar condition. And, you know, whenever these types of discussions come up, you know, I'm, I'm, as, as, your, as your city planner, community development director, I'm going to note that the city should, uh, would be wise to look into establishing a traffic mitigation fees for these types of reasons. But uh, for what it's worth, there's some information. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And then uh, next item is that I would support a crosswalk on Bethel Road because we are talking about putting uh, family units in there, and I imagine that after this uh, project, uh, housing project is built, that we will probably have uh, kids and adults on bicycles riding 
that direction, and I'm, I'm just thinking about long-term safety. So I would support anything that uh, encourages a, a crosswalk with the stop signs there. And then let's see. Uh, my last question is um, in regards to the neighbors that had addressed concerns about water drainage and privacy. Have we reached out to those uh, property owners and um, addressed those issues and come to a compromise, or is it unresolved? Um, so uh, I interacted with, with one property member, Mr. Dan Miller, that he's the affected staff, although the other um, adjacent property owners were provided notice tonight and and, and maybe online to, to speak to this matter. Uh, but the, the condition that came out of my discussions with Mr. Miller, as well as, as completing the initial study for the project um, that, that's relative to, to that concern is, is actually condition number one of the report. Uh, and what condition number one uh, essentially is requiring of the applicant is that the applicant as a condition of approval of the project provide a detailed land, landscaping and fencing plan uh, for our approval and uh, there's a lot of words in it but um, let me keep let me um, just read uh, one or two of the sentences here the purpose of these plans is to provide visual enhancement of the property and to buffer and screen any new development to minimize impact to surrounding land uses so when um, you know if the council supports this condition and a landscaping and fencing plan uh, is prepared uh, by the applicant. What staff is going to be looking for is that uh, it specifically um, address land use compatibility and that we use landscaping or fencing in, in some sort of aesthetically pleasing manner to try to minimize um, those, those land use compatibility impacts. Um, um, so there, there's nothing specific that's been identified yet. But it's been noted as a concern, and, and that is a condition that uh, that is being recommended to have to deal with that concern. Thank you. That's all for me. All right. Um, I chatted with Dusty, and uh, it sounds like you all had some of the same concerns. I, I had had conversations with folks on Willow in the past regarding for something to happen with traffic there, so support uh, crosswalk or a stop sign in some area there, obviously after we do a uh, traffic study. And I think when regards to the drainage, you had mentioned that there would probably be a hydrological study that done by the applicant that would address drainage issues so that they would know what those were. Is that correct, Dusty? Mayor, I'm having a hard time hearing you. It, it almost sounds like you were underwater so I didn't make out what you said I don't know if others were having trouble hearing you oh, okay I had spoken with uh, Dusty about uh, this project and I got in drainage he had mentioned that there'd be a hydrological study that would have to be done um, by the applicants better understanding this where the drainage was going to be an issue I also mentioned that I would also support uh, crosswalk and some sort of stop sign or something recommended by a traffic study. Do you hear that? I did, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so unless there's anything else from the council, I'm going to open up the public hearing for all members of the public to speak on this project. So at this point, um, I will take comments or questions from members of the public. Can uh, for everybody else mute your lines if you're not speaking. All right. So anybody would like to speak to this, please state your name. Hello. Um, my name is Janine Johnson, and I am a property owner on Willow Lane. Um, can you hear me? All right. Yes, ma'am. I can. Go ahead. Okay. Great. Um, I, um, thank you for giving this presentation. This has been a, a talk of our, uh, community, our neighborhood on Willow Lane for a while, because we can obviously see that there was, uh, testing and work being done there and, and we heard that, that that property had been, um, purchased or that was in the process of being purchased. Um, 
So um, I do have um, a few concerns about this um, this uh, development, um, and I wanted to voice those concerns here. Um, one um, of the cons um, so the, uh, as my uh, concern to begin with is that um, so I um, you can see that my name is right there on the on the map there. Um, I'm one of my concerns is the spacing because that dark line between the properties is is my fence. Um, I'm con um, concerned about the spacing that would happen between that fence and the next property and is that is that going to be fence to fence is that what the idea is um so that brings up the privacy dan miller is one of my neighbors and um you know his he voiced that he had a concern about his privacy for um having a, a duplex or having a, a two-story building there and um, I have the same concern. I, I haven't, um, my fence is right there and I would, I like having my privacy and I would like to be able to continue having the privacy. I have children and I have a family and I'm wondering about the, the if that has been something that is brought up. Um, I also, um, as have, having um, lived in this property for um, about six, seven years now, um, I recognize that that land right there is um, a natural zone, um, and um, I, it's really just nice to be able to um, have deer and, and raccoons and other animals um, be able to um, in, um, live in that space. And then also in the winter, I recognize that that place turns into um, a bit of a wetlands. And so it's just, it is, um, uh, I think, a benefit to be able to have a natural zone as well as the creek um, the, that is um, on the um the far side of the property, I recognize that that creek is there, and so um, I have um, a concern about the environmental impact that 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 any sort of construction could um, have, um, and and this in in that space, and um, also the um, as well as the privacy um, as a concern. My other concern with this construction would be the impact of the noise impact of, of having this construction happening and having that, um, how long is this a project uh, set to happen and things like that. So um, there is, this is, I'm voicing this for um, myself as a property owner there, but I'm also voicing it for other people who um, live on Willow Lane who um, are unable to be um, on this, um, at this meeting today. So thank you for letting me voice my opinion and thank you. All right, so just a reminder everybody, um, Kathy's gonna sound the alarm there and it's three minutes per person on this, so if we could keep it brief. If there's some other, we may direct you to talk to staff. There's other things that we can't answer to now. So anybody else from the public that would like to speak? Uh, I would like to speak if, that's, State your name. if you can hear me. Uh, can. My name's Colby. Yeah. My name is Colby Friend. Um, I'm a property owner on, on Bechtel Road. So I'm over on the corner, uh, just as you would come into Crest Lane if you want to move that dot. Uh, over to show where I'm at. I, I'm adjacent to the charter school. And so, um, so you know, I can see that this project would um, obviously have a lot of impact on on my property. And, um, and so, you know, I am concerned about, you know, the amount of traffic that 24 new units would... Um, you know, have coming down a road that we've had no traffic coming down, um, basically. But I also recognize that, you know, it's 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 a big, uh, it's a blank field, and it probably wasn't going to be like that forever. Um, I used to live with Janine over in that property, so uh, and then when we broke up, I bought this property. So my kids travel back and forth across this field, which is about you know. 50, 60 yards. So, so this obviously will have a big impact on, on my life and my family. And um, I, I have a couple of questions, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to be good in 
neighborly and understand that this is a project that maybe will its needs and maybe um, well we need housing and and, and you know um, Ed Mitchell's been a good neighbor so far so I just want to maintain that but I uh, I do have some questions one of the questions is are these houses going to be two story or one story would you like me to answer that Mayor? Uh, uh, yeah or, or, or Mr. Maybe, maybe it would be more appropriate for you to answer that question. Okay, that'd be great. Right. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, this is Ed, and there are no, of the eight uh, single family homes, they're all one story units. Okay. Uh, all right. yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, I was just wondering because of the impact of the light, uh, putting houses in front of the houses on Willow Lane, I think uh, might uh, severely impact the, the light they, they get um, from the west and their sunset. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm also concerned that there's going to be street lights um, where we don't have street lights on Crest Lane. And so it's really rather peaceful and nice and not, not a lot of light pollution in my yard. And um, I was hoping that we could keep the streetlights away from my property anyway. Um, and um, let's see, I also, I was reading your, your, some of the things that you wrote in your, your whole plan, Dusty, and I wasn't sure how fish and wildlife played into it. I, I, th I thought I read that you weren't able to get a hold of them or they didn't respond. And so I didn't know... Um, if that's a protected creek and stuff like that. There's a lot of animals in that, in this area. And I, I gotta be honest with the city council, and maybe this is something you could address either down the road or whatever, but we don't have any green space on the south end of town. So our last park, I think, is Rhett Grove. You know, heading south, there's no more parks, and there's no more green space. And anyway, it's been nice to have this green space, and... Um, you know, while I recognize it's probably not going to last forever, it, you know, we need green space down here too, especially when, gonna, when you're going to put all these new houses in for people. Um, you know, they need parks, they need places to go. And um, so that's that's one of my concerns. And yeah, right, four, four, dude, four, four plexes just seems like a lot. It just does seem like a lot coming down this, this little field that we've had nothing. We've you know, this is very residential. There's only what, six, eight houses on Willow Lane, and I'm over here, and then there's a charter school. So that's like nine houses. Now you're going to add 24 new Mr. houses. Friend, your so. time is up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next, anybody else like to speak? John Sherman. John? <coughs> Yes, I just want to congratulate the applicant and uh, the community development director for a great job. I, I think this is specifically the kind of infield development that Willits desperately needs. It's going to provide housing. Uh, it's going to provide housing that uh, is single family, fee simple housing. And uh, we're really, really short on that in Willits. Uh, we need it. We need it to support our economy. The only concern might be uh, its its uh, proximity to the fault zone, and I think uh, Ed's shown us in the past uh, that he and his engineering team can deal with that effectively, and that uh, the houses uh, that were built in the Hale Creek subdivision were actually more in in uh, in the fault zone than this property is, and they were. To, able to come up with really elegant engineering solutions that I think are going to make those probable distant houses in our valley. So uh, congratulations to Ed and congratulations to Dusty. I think this is a great project and the city needs it. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, anybody else that would like to speak? Yes, I'd like to speak. Hey, your name? Hello. My name is Kelly Barnes, and I am uh, friends with people here who are on Willow Lane. Um, I'm hearing everybody's uh, concerns, and I have a concern based upon the congestion of the fourplex that's at the very end here. 
and road that is contingent to my friend who also owns a property right here next to where the beginning of the of the uh, of the 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 property is going to be. Um, it seems like there's a lot of congestion with putting a fourplex here, um, and it seems like it doesn't support a balanced. Um, um, a situation to have, you know, more natural environment. It, it seems like this is going to be very impact, very much an impact on the outer communities that are around here, including the school. And so, I'd like to bring that up at this point. Okay. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Anybody else from the public? I would like to, Michael Adams. Michael Adams, go ahead, Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for taking our comments at the Gizha Conference. Um, my name is Michael Adams. Um, I co-own uh, 119 Bechtel, um, the property on the northeast side of the proposed access road. Um, Perhaps one of the properties that would be most affected as three houses would be facing this property now. Um, I'm concerned, uh, um, I'm commenting because I, I, I want to support the construction of, of new quality housing in Willits, and certainly infill development is, a, is an efficient way to do it. Um, 24 new units would certainly help the housing situation, um, but it would also bring quite a change to this neighborhood. Um, to that, my first concern is the drainage issue. Um, there's already, as you've noted, as Dusty noted, um, a drainage which is taxed on the heavy rains as it is. And now, if the field is no longer a field, but it is roofs and driveways and a road, and that's all going to get funneled into the same drainage, I think, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that might be a concern. I'm sure many of you have noticed the high flow that can happen there. Uh, during the big rain. Um, second thing I'd like to comment on, um, the sidewalk um, exemption request uh, from the west side, which is the side that our property um, is against. Um, I understand that's a current requirement and they're asking for an exemption to that. Um, from my understanding of that, that would put the road six feet closer to our property and to our house. Um, so I'd like to just, you know, that's not that exciting to move a road closer to our house. Um, so kind of not really in favor of that exemption request. Um, there's a lot of benefit that sidewalks have. Um, they keep, preserve some of the open space. And I understand the reason that they want that is because they want to crush <laughs> It. I'm losing you there. I don't think I would be opposed to one or two less houses being there. Um, that said, um, you know, certainly housing is needed in Willits, and and I appreciate the opportunity to, to comment on this project. Um, thank you for your time, Mr. Adams. Anybody else? From yes. The Would anybody else from the public like to speak? I have one. I have one last question. Um, I was also wondering: Is the housing that is going to be um, implemented? Is it going to be HUD housing? Uh, could Mr. Mitchell speak? Still there? That I I didn't understand. Was it going to be HUD housing? Was that the HUD housing? Yes. yes, that was my question. No, they are not going to be HUD housing. But any other questions from the public? Go on, go on. I'm going to bring it up. All right. I think at this point I'll be closing the public hearing and bringing it back up to the council. So if you 
far as council members, do you have anything else? Yes, I have one other thing. That I noticed that the working time Monday through Friday was from 7 to 7, and I think with all of the people that are around this that maybe it ought to be from 7 till 6. Is that it, Larry? Yes. But it looked like you were going to say something. Did you hear what I had to say? Yes, I did. It and Dusty, did you hear what Larry said? Yeah, I heard that there was a request by uh, Councilmember Stransky to modify the, the allowed construction hours from um, 7 p.m. to change that to 6 p.m. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with that. Um, first of all, I'm not a morning person, so if it were up to me, I would want 8 to 7 instead of 7 to... But anyway, I, I don't think it's unreasonable uh, to have construction noise until 7 p.m. Uh, you know, what, what, is, what do we require everywhere, in, especially in residential areas, is, is not kind of standard? Uh, this is Jeremy Aronco again. Um, our city standards are 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Hmm. If that's city standard, then the same thing should be. All right. Uh, Greta, did you have something? Um, I did. I just I was thinking about that uh, that five foot strip and the discussion about you know making sure that that doesn't become a weedy thing. And I immediately started thinking about fire safety. I see that um, Fire Chief Wilkes is on this call. I wonder if he would be willing to weigh in if he has any concerns about that strip. Chief Wilkes, you there? Chief Wilkes? Maybe he's left. Okay. Madge, did you have anything else? Otherwise, I was... Um, no, I just agreed with uh, some of the comments that came earlier before the public um, comments were opened up about um, the landscaping and uh, the assurance that some of the that the city wouldn't necessarily uh, accept responsibility for the road until a major part of the de development has uh, gone forward so that we don't have the liability without the benefits. Uh, there were several comments that I hope Dusty kept track of and will uh, be able to include. Thank you, Matt. And Sabrina. I, I think, as was mentioned, they're all my concerns. I thank the public um, and the neighbors for expressing uh, their views, and uh, we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. And again, I'd like to thank all the neighbors that uh, usually send out those letters and everything, but some folks never respond and appreciate hearing from them. I do have one more question, excuse me, Jerry. Um, I was also wondering the square footage of the homes and how much are the um, homes going for, the property value of the homes? I think I brought it up here, but Ed is still on. I'll let them answer that question. Ed, are you there? Oh, this is Ed. Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. The anticipated square footage is 1,600 uh, square feet to, uh, to uh, 1,900 square feet. Um, one of my concerns that listening to the comments of the council is, uh, and maybe Dusty and Jeremy can answer this better, but in my experience, I don't know how you file a tentative map and create the parcels and sell them uh, if the city haven't has not accepted the improvements i mean how do you flush a toilet if it's not a city i i don't know i'm a little confused by that one i've never quite run into this issue before uh, uh i don't know that's a tough one I, I just don't and i don't i don't understand your your question to your to your frustration i don't, i'm not clearly understanding it Okay, uh, as I understand, the council wants some assurances before they accept the improvements that 
a certain number, whatever that number might be, um, of the houses uh, be complete. Well, if that's the case, how do you sell any? I mean, how do I sell the first one? Because um, I don't have a sewer. I don't have a water system. It's not... When, when the final map is recorded and accepted and all the, the, the improvements have to be bonded for, that's a guarantee that they're going to be done. But I don't know how you tie a certain number. This is not a condominium project, so I don't know how you tie in the completion. Let's, let's just hypothetically say 50% of the houses before the city accepts the improvements. I, I, don't, know how you, I don't know how you sell the first one. Um, you you, you got to be able to flush the toilet and have city water and city improvements. And that's all created when the final map is recorded. As I understand it, maybe I'm maybe missing something, but that's what I believe. Um, Ed, um, I don't think you fully answered uh, Janine's question, but then I was going to see if Jeremy could, could chime in after, regarding what you said. I think she asked what, what what the price range might be of these houses. That's something you can, you know yet or not. I'm sorry, I, Derry, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I think Janine had asked uh, what, what sort of price range uh, what the houses are. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I really, I, I, I don't know. You know, our goal would be to uh, uh, be less than four hundred thousand. Okay. That's our that's our that's our goal. Um, obviously, you know the cost of improvements and things like that uh, dictate a lot of that. But that's our objective: is to be less than four hundred thousand. What, what about you. the fourplexes? Can can we ask uh, uh, Ed about the fourplexes? Uh, fourplexes. Yes, I mean they're going to be. Written. The, these fourplexes I have built uh, previously. I built these in the city of Sonoma. Um, they are about 1,220 square feet each unit. So the entitled the the fourplex itself is about uh, 4,880 square feet. So the unit is 12 1,220 feet, two bedroom, two bath. Um, uh, I've, I've like I said I built them before. I, they absolutely, the four plans are what I consider to be um, very, very uh, usable. And that's why I like to build them. I've done it before. So they're very attractive. Are these going to be rentals or condos? And uh, about the price range, if they are, uh, yeah. If, you know, is it going to serve some of our lower moderate income um Folks, uh, I, I know we need housing, but you know it's nice to have a range of prices available. If you if you have an estimate on that, Ed, I'd appreciate it. I, you know, I don't. I, I have not done a rental survey, but I don't know what a twelve a, a new twelve uh, hundred uh, square foot two bedroom two bath apartment goes for or rental unit. They're not condominiums. Um, but I would think they'd be somewhere between nine hundred and twelve hundred a month. Um, I have not completed any kind of um, rental survey, for the, and I don't own rental other uh, apartments in the city, so I really don't know what they are. But that's my opinion. My guess is somewhere between nine and twelve hundred a month. So, Thank you. Question. Question for Jeremy, if he's still there, or or Dusty, regarding what Ed had asked as far as um, process for accepting the. Uh, dedication of the street or the improvements, whatever. And can you explain that, one of you? Uh, th this is Dusty. Uh, and, and I have to say, I sort of, I, I, sur I, I struggled a little bit with that that uh, request by um, by some of the council members as well, just because it's, it's a little bit um, unstandard. Uh, but I, I certainly recognize the concern in that um, the city's really uh, not in a position to be taking maintenance of a new road uh, if it's not going to um, support new development. Um, but 
But uh, Mr. Mitchell is correct in that, he, you know, in order for him to be able to build the structures and sell them and have them be occupied, they, they certainly do need to be served by city water and sewer services. And, and, and that just kind of leads me to try to get some clarification from, uh, from council. It is the intent that the, the road itself, the physical roadway, would not be in a sidewalk and uh, would not be accepted um, until a certain number of housing units were developed? Or was it all improvements, including the water and sewer upgrade infrastructure and the drainage infrastructure? That uh, Mayor Sabrina was that was her question. Sure, I, th I, th I think it was Greta and I, and I'd be happy to weigh in first. We just want some some sense of assurance that by the time the the project, let's say that the the project the road is done, um, but yet uh, we only have three houses on it. Uh, that during the period of time until it takes to get to its say 50 percent uh, capacity on in housing on the road that we wouldn't be responsible for any kind of major road repair i'm not asking even in my opinion i'm not asking that the, the all the housing is completely done i just want to know that you know if it takes them five years to put in three houses and then the during those five years, uh, we have some kind of major issue uh, with the road that the city's not in a financial position where we have to feel and slurry the road or do any kind of major improvements to the road um, when we're not receiving any kind of income. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, um, and Jeremy, you're welcome to chime in, of course, as well. Um, but the... A couple, a couple thoughts is trying to, to craft some language um, to capture the intent of the council. Um, we have condition number 32 uh, uh, that says the applicant shall offer to dedicate on the final maps of the city for will for public use all the public streets right away shown on the final map. Uh, we could potentially add language that said something to the effect that the city shall not accept dedication of the public street until X number of residential units are constructed and available for occupancy. Um, that that's one thing I wrote down. The, we also have like condition that. number. We have, we also have condition number 36, which states the applicant shall provide sufficient surety guaranteeing the public improvements for a period of one year. Um, if the concern is that the road and other public improvements, but the road would probably be the main one potentially, um, was going to deteriorate while we continue to see a lack of development on the property, I wonder if a solution would be to extend that period from one year to a, a longer period. So anyways, that's just a, a couple ideas and I'm, I'm certainly open for other suggestions. Hey, Dusty, it's Jeremy chiming in. I, I missed the first part of that, so I'm just catching up. Um, the, the first part of Ed's question. Um, but, I, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a uh, interesting sort of question. I mean, there's not a ton of concern that the road's going to need a lot of repairs in that amount of time if they build it to our standards, um, especially if there's not a lot of development on it. Um, I, I wouldn't expect us to have to do much maintenance there, but I mean, I do definitely understand the concern and, and you know, desire to have some protection. Um, I, I think what, as long as we're allowed to make the conditions you're suggesting, that's probably the best best thing I can come up with. Jeremy. Well, this is that again. You know, uh, Jeremy, if you, if we build those streets to your standards, which which we have to do, um, an example would be Hale Creek. You know, those streets were built in 2005 and six, and I'd be willing to bet you you haven't spent a uh, thousand bucks out there in the 15 years that they've been built. Um, I, I I I don't know. This is uh, I don't know 
about to say. Uh, I, I just don't know how you build a housing project that that I used to the roads, and uh, I, I don't know. I I've never never seen this before, but maybe we can figure it out. Uh, this is Sabrina. I, I understand your frustration because you're coming from from the perspective that you're you're building these housing, but we're coming from the perspective of the council, and we don't always uh, know all the detailed information. So the questions that we're asking are based on on what our knowledge is, and just because we asked the question of of the road, I think I've heard some good arguments to modify and not to modify. Um, and the more information you give us, you know, for example, you just made a good point about Hell Creek, how you built it to specification, and there hasn't been any maintenance on it. All we're, all we're doing is asking questions so we can fully make sure that we're making the best decision for the city by collecting as many uh, facts as we can. So thank you for that information. You're welcome. I, I, uh and I'm sorry for my frustration. I just, uh, I know that to, uh, in order to do these projects, you know, there are a substantial amount of funds uh, expended. And you sure, uh, the only way to get those uh, dollars back is to complete a development. Um, and I wish I was the kind of person that could just let that money sit there for 20 years, but I, I can't, so... You know, I, I can tell you right now, I'm going to be actively building in homes as fast as I can and selling them. And, you know, with if, if something disastrous doesn't happen, uh, you know, I'm anticipating within a year of the uh, road being um, built, we're going to be done. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I'm sorry. I echo what Sabrina said. I mean, this is, we're, we're doing the public's uh, business here, and so... Sometimes we wander the weeds as a council, but it's for the good of the public so that we're answering these questions. They're responsible for the uh, city budget, and uh, it's not like we're flush with cash, just like I'm sure you're not, and so we're all kind of just trying to watch out for the public. Um, but I also agree with Jeremy, and uh, I think your Hale Creek example is right if you build it to our standards, it's on us to... Uh, it's on us to ask these questions here, so thank you, everybody. Okay, if nobody else from the council has any questions, I've closed the public hearing, and so at this point, I would be looking for some sort of motion. Yeah. Okay, go on. Question? Okay, good. name? This is Greta. Okay, sorry. I, I just wanted to say to Mr. Mitchell, I, I'm sorry that you feel these questions are, are frustrating. Um, you've done a beautiful job with the Hill Creek um, project. Everyone, I think, would agree that that's been a great addition to town. And this is obviously a well-thought-out plan. Uh, you've worked well with the Community Development Department. So I certainly don't mean any disrespect or to cause you concern by asking these questions. It, it truly is, as, as Jerry has stated, you know, we're all just hypersensitive of expenditure that the city might not be able to afford so it's really no no dig at you or at this plan um and i'm you know i have great confidence that you know that this plan will be as well executed as the hill creek plan so thank you for for humoring us by answering these questions i, I also had a comment um if i can do that but this, this is madge um just that Having heard some of the uh, nearby residents there, I totally am sympathetic with the idea that it would be wonderful to have open space and parks and more amenities uh, in the south end of town, um, but we can't afford them and this is private property and we really do need housing and I, I think this will, you know, it, it'll be uh, probably a little hard during construction and it does you know, eliminate some open space that everybody loves to have around them. But um, in the greater good for the city, I think it is important that we uh, allow the private development of private property for housing that's going to benefit our uh, residents that need housing. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, it isn't always easy as a neighbor to 
put up with new construction and changes in your neighborhood. Uh, but I do think Ed has a pretty good track record for uh, very responsible development, and that this will be uh, this will be a good project. And and it really is in Ed's uh, self interest to move the project along, obviously too. So I guess I'm not so concerned that we'll have a a road that belongs to the city with no development happening. I mean, Ed's going to want to get those houses up, and and there is a demand. So I'm okay with that. Thank you, Mitch. I think at this point, I just kind of want to explain to everybody that what we're approving today is the, is the subdivision. Ultimately, Ed will have to work. Ed will have to work with uh, staff and go through all the different approval processes as they move forward with engineering and uh, <coughs> oops, our, our, our city engineers and our uh, community development director to make sure that all the uh, I's are dotted and these are crossed. That's how the process Larry? Yes. It's Larry. I'm, probably, I'm the, probably the only council member on this uh, council that was went through uh, Hale Creek and this one now. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of stories that went around. And so I think that everybody deserves a uh, to watch it. And um, and to come up with the best solution and uh, the different specs on the housing and the streets and everything are different than on Hale Creek also. And so I'm sure that everybody will watch it and uh, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. All right, so at this point I'll be looking for a motion on the uh, subdivision. I have a motion. I'll move to approve staff recommendation. I'll second the motion. Vice President. Kathy. All vote. Councilmember Connie. Yes. Rodriguez. Yes. Strong. Yes. Stransky. Yes. Mayor Gonzalez. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Right here. At this point, we are reconvening or as the city council again. We are on item uh, eight, the manager reports and recommendations. Item A, adopt a resolution awarding contract to Ramatula, political strategist, for $25,000 for public education and consulting regarding potential sales tax measure city of Willits. And Stephanie, did you want to present this? Yes. Um, Stephanie Gerbrandt, Sierra, city manager. Uh, before you was a resolution awarding a contract to Tramatola, political strategist, for $25,000 for public education and consulting regarding potential sales tax measure for the city of Willits. Um, since 2019, uh, in the last two budgets, the finance uh, the Finance Committee had recommended that staff bring back a sales tax measure for the City of Bullets for the 2020 general election because of the continued structural deficit and um, declining revenues for the City of Bullets. Um, we have seen that sales tax in the past eight years has declined by 8%, and um, obviously expenses have been rising, particularly insurance um, and other, other costs. Uh, because of that, we have cut and cut, and um, the finance directors have uh, recommended that we can't, we simply can't cut anymore and, and probably still be a city. Um, we really require revenue enhancements. Uh, right now, we are the lowest health tax in the region in both Lake and, and Mendocino counties, um, as we did not do any uh, increases in sales taxes when all the neighboring cities did. Um, we do place this on the ballot. The, the measure will go up to the voters to decide. And um, we think it's obviously essential that the public is very well informed and there's a lot of outreach regarding the measure, um, even before it's put on the ballot, and that they have a voice in the use of the potential revenues that such a measure could bring. Um, revenue measures, um, as you probably 
probably know it would depend on qualified professionals to really concentrate on how best to reach out to the community so the community understands the need. And then they also have input on, on what the city could do with, these, with additional funds um, and that they, they are reached out to in the most efficient way possible. Um, knowing, uh, I know that uh, the mayor asked me to make sure that uh, we found a good consultant for this as we really do need one. Um, especially since staff is so we're so short-handed, and frankly, this isn't what we're good at. This isn't we don't know how to to do this sort of political consulting. Um, I reached out, knowing that we have not much money. I uh, really looked at the gamut of who is out there to do political consulting, and I and I actually took a chance, and I and I called the best consultant I know in California, um, Tramatola political strategists. Uh, they've been in the business for. Uh, over 25 years, and I know that they have a soft spot for um, giving back, and and I uh, that is sort of where their heart is. And I kind of reached out, and I said, "Look, we're a small town." Are you there? Can you hear me? Okay, look like you dropped off for a sec. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll speak more directly into the phone. Um, so I, I wrote a little bit about uh, uh, Larry Tramatola. Um, he is one of the country's top political strategists, and he's an, an expert in grassroots organizing. And he and I have had a couple of conversations about reaching out to the community to find out what their what their interests are and what their needs are. And also, he's very interested in reaching out to council individually to find out. Um, what council feels that the community needs. Um, the fact that he's willing to work for twenty-five thousand dollars is pretty amazing. It's a it's a fraction of what political consultants normally charge, but he's frankly doing it because he's been to Willits. He's gone through Willits. He worked on a campaign in South Wales, and he, he knew he knew the city well. And he said he thought it would be a great thing to do, and, and he understands the need. We've talked to him about the need. And so I'm asking you today if, um, to, to approve this contract so we can make sure that the ballot measure is written correctly. Um, because that's a, another key thing that he can do is make sure that it's written correctly, that it's um, in the right format, and just do it the right way. And he has you know, lots of experience in this. Um, I know that our... Um, finance director is on the line, and I know there are questions about, you know, how we're going to pay for this, and um, he did write, the, our finance director, Andy Heath, did write the financial impact statement on this, and um, I would invite him to, to chime in on on the sort of the cost-benefit analysis. And Andy, are you there? Yes, I am. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, good, evening, good evening, Mayor, members of the council. For the record, Andy Heap, the city's finance, uh, interim finance director. Um, in looking at this item, uh, one thing that I noticed was it was a new budget expenditure. Um, it's going to be this year. Uh, if you approve the contract, um, it could carry over into next year as well. Um, but more importantly, that your general fund, which would pay for this measure, uh, because sales tax accrues to the general fund, um, is in a deficit position. So, as Stephanie pointed out, you know, there is a structural deficit, um, and there's various things that have uh, added to that structural deficit. But having a political consultant like this come in to potentially um, educate everybody and, more importantly, get the information that might be necessary to assure um, the highest level of potential success in passing this tax measure um, is, is a pretty good deal for 25000 uh, In my travels around the state uh, and in 30 years of finance, um, $25,000 for what these types of individuals do is it's really not that much. So it's pretty cheap, frankly. Um, and I know that this consultant is one of the best consultants out there as well. From a cost-benefit perspective, to the extent the city was successful uh, with the sales tax measure, you're looking at potentially upwards of a million dollars of additional sales tax that would accrue to the general fund. Um, and that's a, right away in one year, a 40 to one payout. So it, might, it probably makes uh, prudent fiscal sense uh, to look at alternative means to generate revenues into the city. 
uh, given the structural deficit. Uh, cutting costs, just it, it, can, it can be done to some degree and to, and to some extent, but I think your city has reached that extent uh, at this point in time, based on what I know. So uh, looking at this uh, contract is probably a fiscally prudent thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Heap. So, Jeffrey, do we have anybody else to hear from? Otherwise, I'll open it up to council. Yep. That's it. Well, Madge, you're, you're on the finance committee with me, so. Um, yeah. So, you're calling on me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I actually did a thumbnail uh, that with about 5,000 residents, that's about five dollars per person to pay for the consultant to you know to do the best job that we can in presenting a sales tax proposal and that's not as if he's going to give everybody five dollars but he's going to be preparing the, uh, the measure and all of the information doing a lot of outreach to the community so i do think it's um it's money that we need to spend in order to survive because we're without um enhancing our revenue um our city isn't isn't ever going to you know we're going to run out of our reserves in a couple or maybe three years um and there is no other way to really uh, correct that um uh, and that includes you know the only way we could cut costs enough to break even would be essentially eliminate the police force but if we did that we'd have to contract with the sheriff's department to provide the policing and that would probably cost more than our police so you know it really is a, a matter of financial survival of the city i think um and the other thing that i tend to be um what's the word reluctant to do a re quote-unquote regressive tax which sales tax could be considered but in this case i don't think it is particularly regressive because for one thing it just puts us on a par with other jurisdictions all around us so we're we're now less uh, sales tax than anybody else around us and there's uh, you know that that isn't really fair and the sales tax generated in our city um, comes a lot of it from the, the people that live outside the city limits but use the city so it helps them pay for our city services um, and and also tourists and, and visitors to our area and then um, probably most importantly is that sales tax does not apply to food or medication or rent or health care um, you know so that the necessities aren't going to be subject to any increase in tax it's really just um, consumer discretionary spending that uh, that would be subject to the tax. So I think it's a really good idea to do it, and I think this sounds like the very best way to get the job done right. And uh, and if we're going to go for this tax measure, we want to do a good job of it. So uh, I'm I'm strongly in favor. Uh, Larry, I have nothing. Okay. Right up. I have nothing. And Sabrina? I'm struggling with this one, I'll be honest. And the reason that I'm struggling is we're not just talking about the $25,000 expenditure by approving this. We're not only approving a $25,000 expenditure, uh, but to place this item on the ballot, we're, we're in essence stating that we're also allocating those funds and then lastly, we're making, we're making, we're, we're, we're in essence publicly stating and voting in favor of putting the item on the ballot, which isn't, which isn't really what uh, we've had a whole discussion about um, as a council. Um, I, I, I know that the city needs the funds. Um, I see it from that angle, but at the same time, as a business owner, and I would be collecting these funds as a retail business owner and as a taxpayer, and I'm, I'm typically not 
pro more taxation. Uh, I feel like we're tax, tax, tax. But I also know that as a city, we're under taxing compared to other cities. And we have a problem before us. So I'll, I suppose when the moment comes, I'll cast my vote, but with a heavy heart. at the moment and I kind of feel the same way I, I don't like more taxes but I have to tell you the whole time I was chief of police we cut um, started out with more officers and we cut it's like we'll talk about wanting parks and wanting things like that and it's when we can't I feel like I'm the no person these days I have this no we can't afford it and I know I've heard, you know, we live in our means. Well, I think what we're heading towards, uh, we, you're not going to be able to keep going into our reserves. That, uh, will we disincorporate or something like that? It may not get to that point, but it may get to the point that we cut a lot of services. Don't uh, do something about it. Um, and the other one is that there are a lot of folks in the county that come into the city and use our services, our swimming pools, our ball fields, etc. We talked about doing something regarding a rec district, but you know, even to get that off the ground, and even then, um, it's really hard. And so when folks come in and use our services, um, city residents are basically putting the bill for that. It's not like we can put up a sign saying you're from Brook Trails or you're from North of Town and we don't want you here. It's, and uh, I've also heard that, I don't know, I, I, I struggle too. I don't. I, I don't like paying more in taxes. Um, you know, I, I think what a consultant can do is um, walk us through and help us explain how we're, what people are going to get for it. And it ultimately, you know, go to the electorate and they can decide whether they want to do this or not, what they're going to get for it. So that's how I feel. So I, I feel like I'm supporting this because I just don't know at this point it's a matter of we don't generate revenue, we're going to be looking at some serious cuts. And when I say serious, I'm talking about things that we won't be doing. And uh, not just the niceties that other cities offer that we don't offer. At this point, I'm going to open it up to the public. Would anybody from the public like to speak on to this matter? Bring it back up to us. At this point, I'll be looking for a motion. I will move approval of the staff recommendation. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Very. Any further discussion? Council Member. Hearing none, at this point, I will offer the vote. Councilmember Connie. No. Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez. No. Stransky. Yes. Strong. Yes. Mayor Gonzalez. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, everybody, for that. At this point, we are on to permit recommendations, and we have item A, discussion and possible action approving plans, specifications for the City of Willits Downtown Improvement Project, project number 2020-02, authorizing advertisement for bids. So Jeremy and uh, Project, so still Yeah, this is Jeremy Ronco, Project Manager, and... Uh, and Andrea Trincado, Project Manager. We're both on the line to talk about this. Um, uh, just as the staff report says, um, sort of the main, main focus of this project was to fill in those uh, planter strips on Main Street, um, which have really become uh, sort of a, a pedestrian barrier and a, a, 
you know, potential safety issue. Um, and then to also plant some, some trees. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing permeable brick pavers. Um, we're planting 38 trees uh, at various locations. Um, and that, the, the, sorry, the, the project um, starts at West Valley Street and ends um, at the Sherwood intersection on Main Street. Uh, yeah, um, and we're, we're making use of the, the Caltrans provided conduit for irrigation as much as possible. Um, there are a few locations where we don't have that option. We will be hand watering trees there, um, but for the most part, these trees will be set up on, uh, you know, automatic irrigation. Um, and construction construction is scheduled to start uh, in late September, so um, uh, we're, we timed the the project to begin then um, because that's the optimal time for, for planting trees um, and for the, the tree planting to be successful. Um, the, the project will, um, uh, you know, be, hopefully it will not impact um, the, the parking too dramatically, but we do anticipate having uh, you know, the shoulder area blocked off um, in the areas that they're going to be working. Um, and the the contractor, we will be directing the contractor to, to work with, um, with the businesses um, to, to try to minimize impacts as much as possible. Yeah, um, they will definitely be taking up the, you know, the parking adjacent to where they're working, but... Hopefully not the travel lane, at least. Um, and it's a, you know, we have a 39-day schedule. We think that's probably plenty of time to do this. So, you know, hopefully get them out before the end of October. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think they'll be in any one location for, you know, too long. It's going to kind of depend on what's going on there. But, um you know, I'd hope that they'd be moving fairly quickly and not just parked out in front of somebody for weeks on end. Um, we also have uh, a, a grant paying for the trees, um, and that grant comes with some um, sort of uh, requirements for for planting, and one of them that, that was a big factor in the design is a minimum of uh, 24 square feet of open space around each tree, um, which is, you know, a nice big area for the tree, but that is going to be basically just mulch and a tree in the middle, similar to now, only will fill the mulch up all the way at least to the sidewalk, you know, top of the sidewalk. Um, but there will be open spaces, and that's just sort of considered best practices for tree planting now. Um, that's the best best thing for the health of the trees. And um, the the rest of the the, the pavers will be paid for um, by D one funds, um, and uh, I guess the the these will work on on a reimbursement basis. Um, the the grant funding and the D1 funding, yeah. um, as, and then the water fund will, will pay for um, some portion of the project as well. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. It's, uh, do you have any questions about specifics? Do you want to go through any of the plans? Uh, I mean, this is Jerry. I just wanted to ask um, the purposes of the folks out there is permeable. That means that the uh, pavers basically water flows through them. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, all it really means with pavers is there's a slightly bigger gap in between the, the bricks um, to let water in. 
you just you, you fill in this aggregate between them and you just use a little bit bigger aggregate and it lets water in. Can you explain what D1 funds are? Just a mm, it can. Um, D1, D1 funds are um, a, a funding that is uh, administered by the state and it's collected by um, by the Mendocino Council of Governments, and um, and they hold the funds for us. Uh, they collect um, somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars per year, depending on the year. Um, and they hold those funds in, until we have an eligible project, and then we um, we basically tell them, you know, that we we want the funds for the the project, and um, and they will provide them for for us. But they are um, regional regional surface transportation program funding. Um, so it really needs to be um, related to uh, to you know road improvements and and um, traffic safety, pedestrian safety, and, which is and pedestrian safety. Um, and so the the pavers are providing a. Um, a pedestrian pathway to the sidewalk um, from the, the parking area, so that that's why they're eligible for this funding. The last question before I open up to the council members: the water fund. What what exactly? Why is the water fund contributed to this so there? Uh, the metering and the the water funds paying for some of the irrigation and the um, and the service installations. Service installations and. Okay. Just the water stuff. Right. At this point, I'm going to open up. Larry, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, are you going to do this simultaneously, the trees and the pavers at the same time, or the pavers go first or the trees first? Um, because we're going to get a lot of, of inquiries, people in the community, and I would like to have... Uh, be able to tell them what's going to happen and how how it's going to happen. I'm not sure exactly how they're going to sequence it, but I mean the trees and the pavers will all be planted within the or, or put in within the 39 days of the project schedule. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure which one they're going to do first. The more I think about it, the the one thing that is sort of possible, and it's probably good to point out, um, is the availability of the trees may or may not be an issue because um, we did specify some larger trees. Um, it's called the 24 inch inch box, um, so it's a, a slightly more mature tree than usual, um, and that could just it could affect, you know, specific species being available to us at a certain time. Um, In addition to, um, you know, some of the uh, the supply issues that um, that have been kind of across the board with uh, with shelter in place, um, we've we've gathered information about, you know, the fact that that, that may affect availability yeah. as well. And we don't know. I mean, it, it might not be an issue, but it might be. And, you know, if that does come up, we're going to have to, you know, potentially make a decision on, you know, if we, we want to substitute a certain spe species for another one or if we're, you know, dead set on something, maybe waiting a little bit to plant a certain tree, extending the contract. Um, you know, we'll see what options we have if that becomes an issue, but it's definitely something that it's possible that we're going to have to deal with. Also, I would like to congratulate you guys on the, on the wells, the watering wells, because I think that's a really neat idea. We have never had watering in the for the city street trees all the years at street trees and that's been one of the fatal things and it was tough getting the water to go down the street when granite did it as i'll tell you that or for the council also so yeah I'm, thanks for that thanks no i you know honestly scott herman and uh, bill wilson actually worked really hard with granite to uh to set us up for this irrigation and uh 
Scott had actually forgotten how good a job they did until we went out and looked at everything, and we were all very pleasantly surprised at, at how set up it was. So that was nice. Good job. This is Dusty. I just want to mention that Bill Wilson typically was out there almost every day following them around and making sure that they implemented the improvements so that we could have water for those trees. So I'm, I'm glad to, to mention Bill's name on that. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Dusty. Bill actually did work extremely hard on this project. And, uh, yeah, it, he should definitely have been recognized for that. Larry, did you have anything else? Oh, that'll do it. Thank you for right now. Etch? I don't think I have any comments or questions, um, but excellent, excellent work, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I know Greta did some um, research on the kinds of trees, so if she has any comments about the tree selection understanding, of course, some things might have to be substituted, but it's important that we don't have trees like the ones on... Uh, is it Mendocino Ave where they tear up everything? Yeah. So yeah. I know that the choice of trees is very important. Yeah. 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 Put amber. <laughs> uh, I'm just uh, pleased to see this moving forward. I just want to thank all the city staff who have worked on this. Uh, thank you, Dusty, for working on the Dusty and Jim for working on the grant to help pay for the trees. Um, Jeremy and Andrea, you've put a lot of hours into this, of course, Bill and Scott, so um, this will be a, a nice improvement for our downtown, get some some greenery and uh, help clean up those weedy foot traps that are the most trip. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. Uh, yes, I would just uh, echo the fact that I'm appreciative of all the hard work that went into it. And no further questions. Okay. At this point, I will open it up to the public. If anybody has some questions, uh, may I ask a question? Go ahead. State your name. For, um, yeah, my question was, uh, since we have this opportunity to put trees downtown, um, can we have fruit trees? Would that be a possibility? They give a little more to the community? Uh, we've had some bad experiences planting fruit trees uh, in the past just from a maintenance standpoint. Um, it's, you know, they're frankly, they're, they're pretty messy if they bear fruit. Um, and if they don't, they're not too healthy. Um, it's we were really careful about the the specific tree species we did choose because most trees don't like being planted in an urban setting like this so we had to we had to really do our homework and and try to choose trees that were going to be successful in planter strips like this um and you know not many fruit trees really like this except plums and plums are probably one of the messiest trees you can plant so i think our maintenance department would not be happy if we planted those there and we also tried we also to, to uh, choose trees that would offer um a balance of of you know fall color and um and shade um, there, there are areas that don't uh, lend themselves well to, to larger trees, so, so we cho chose smaller trees uh, for those, those areas as well. I, can I chime in, Jerry? I, I just also wanted to say I was on the, um, the, the tree committee, and um, fruit trees were definitely discussed. One of the biggest issues with fruit trees is that in order to do well, they need annual pruning and we just don't have the staff to be able to do that um and so then um it really did become a concern about having healthy trees that weren't going to cause problems for pedestrians or the neighboring businesses so it's a great idea they do offer more um but probably in the setting they they weren't the best choice and they'd be much better in community gardens um where they could actually get their their proper maintenance and attendance so for what it's worth we did think about it all right 
Well, we also had that cork tree cut down on the north end of town. Maybe the cork tree would be nice to uh, replace that one that was accidentally or intentionally cut down. I don't know what the story was, but... Cork trees on our list. Anyway. You have a yep, few. we have two cork trees. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, no, for this. I'm signing out. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else from the public like to speak? Going and done. Okay. Back up here. Um, guys, getting this together and making sure, I mean, it all comes back to money again and somebody has to prune them or whatever and even getting it built is something I'll worry about when the street was. So it's something I think we promised the community we would do. It's kind of nice to get the promise. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, you're kind of uh, coming in and out, um, so okay. if you can speak louder, maybe. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, I will call for the motion. There's a motion on this project. It would still move. Larry? Uh, Ms. Saprina, I'll second the motion. Motion seconded by Saprina. All right, any further discussion? If not, I will call for the vote. Councilmember Connie. Most emphatically, yes. <laughs> Rodriguez. Yeah. Strong. Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> Transky. Yeah. Mayor Gonzalez. Yes. Thank you. All right. So, at this point, I guess I will, uh, item nine, part of recommendations. Um, Stephanie, do you have anything else? Um, I don't. I, I think I wanted to just mention that as I um, notified council and um, is that we did do a test for the uh, sewer influence for COVID-19 and it was found to be present at the city of Willits. Um, We've been working on our presentation to, uh, for our sewer bonds, and uh, tomorrow we are going to go before the rating agency, and there's something that we've been working on for a while, and it's a big presentation because the city does not have a rating uh, for bonds because we haven't done it in a while, so it required quite a bit of preparation, and so we're excited about doing that tomorrow, and I hope it does well. And that's all I have at this time. Thank you. Uh, Kathy. Yes, uh, I would like to remind everybody that City Council election packets start in a couple weeks. Actually, July 13th will run until August 7th. We have three open seats, so anyone that lives within the city limits and would like to run for City Council, please contact me at 459-7121 so that we may schedule an appointment to issue your packet. Um, I'd also like to say swim lessons are going well at the pool. I spoke with Maddie the last couple days, and um, the kids are kind of loving the one-on-one -on -one more than a, a big group, so that's nice to hear. And lap swim's going well. It's full every day. Thank you. Uh, our chief of police on. Chief of police on. Hello, this is Chief Allen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have nothing to report. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dusty, do you have anything else? Uh, I do not, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Jim, do you have anything? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. And human resources? Start. Did I get everybody? No. This is Sabrina. I have a question for Chief Allen. That's Sabrina. Chief, are you still there? 
Yes, hello? Hi, good evening. This is Council Member Sabrina Rodriguez. I was wondering good evening, if... Uh, good evening. I was wondering if the uh, Willits Police Department has had any... Um, what's the proper word? Uh, any kind of uh, negative um, experiences worth noting um, in regards to uh, some of the uh, uh, racial... Um, uh, the racial happenings that are happening in our community, has there been a significant impact or anything worth uh, mentioning in relationship to that in our, in our police department? Are they feeling supported? That sort of thing. Could you just briefly let us know how things are going there? Absolutely, ma'am, and thanks for asking. Uh, no, we have experienced no significant uh, issues uh, relating to what's going on uh, nationwide. Uh, we feel very supported by the community, uh, and we are very appreciative of uh, the community's patience uh, in uh, in these challenging times. So, nothing to report on that front. I, I hope that answered your question. Can I also thank? Okay, uh, I wanted to ask also. You had, I think, mentioned that you were going to be presenting. Uh, to the council at some point, a kind of review of what our police policies are now and any changes that you have made or that you were considering. And I'm wondering if that's um, scheduled in the next month or two. Just uh, absolutely. So uh, as, as you can imagine, um, nationwide, there, there, there have uh, been some controversies and some moves to uh, eliminate the carotid hold from um, from uh, as one of the procedures control violent suspects. Uh, I am in the process of reviewing and will be removing that particular um, uh, tool, if you will, or or procedure from uh, from our use of force policy, uh, and we'll have alternate use of force uh, options that, w that will be available to keep both the, the person being taken into custody and the police officer safe. But uh, just to be clear, we will be removing the carotid uh, hold, uh, which is the hold that, that restricts uh, blood flow to the um, and, and causes unconsciousness. Uh, I will be, uh, I'm available to present that uh, in the next month or so, and I look forward to that opportunity. Well, my, I'm going to say that um, there are other things that have been proposed around the country, some of which uh, I think we probably don't have a problem with, but I don't really know what our policies are overall, and I don't think now is the time after such a long meeting uh, to, to go into it, but I would like us to have a chance where we actually have an agendized item to review what our policies are and consider whether there are any um, adjustments that the council and the public um, want to consider. Absolutely, I look forward to that. I have a question too, a quick question for the chief. I bet. Um, I just wondered, did the council ever follow up on doing a thank you to um, the LAPD for the generous donation they made to your department chief? Uh, not as yet, but uh, I have communicated with the uh, police chief of LAPD and thanked him uh, on our behalf of the city. Thank you. Hey. And, and chief, I just want you to know that I believe that we, we did mention it at a council meeting when you were uh, down south uh, picking up those those items. So unfortunately, you didn't hear, but we are indeed very appreciative, and we want to make sure that, that you know that. Thank you so much for that. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Chief. And I've kind of got all the staff now, so... Point, we are on item 10, City Council Committee, Boards, and Agency Reports. Barry? I have nothing. Patch? All right, well, um, the easy one to report on is um, 
Mendocino Solid Waste Management, we had a meeting and we had a guest from um, Cal Recycle, the statewide, um, talking a lot about the changing and increasing mandates for diverting organic waste um, and maximizing the use of our green bins. And in particular, there's a lot of um, things that can be done for uh, rec uh, restaurants, com commercial and industrial uses, as well as, as, well as residential uses. But um, there's a, a lot happening, a lot of statewide mandates that we're uh, looking at how to meet. Um, and then we are going to, I think, in two months, have a presentation on the other recycling issues, which are really problematic because the market um, disappeared, you know, a year or two ago in China, stopped taking recyclables. And, and we just definitely want to hear from um, Jerry Ward and also Cal Recycle on how they all are doing their best to, to address that and minimize our landfill and waste uh, waste stream. And by the way, um, I think it was something like 75% uh, reduction. Yeah, the goal is 75% reduction in organic waste, but it also has a really beneficial impact on climate because the uh, organic waste, if you landfill it, it produces a lot of methane, so it's very bad. Um, the difficult one is Economic Development and Financing Corporation. We had a meeting um, on June 11th, which was going swimmingly until our two county representatives, Jan Judy and um, Ted Williams, sort of, um, well, they, they basically said they were recommending cutting the county's funds to EDFC and that they were unhappy with um, the way things were going. But it was the first that we had heard of that. And so the board members and staff were somewhat taken by surprise. Um, and we also, because of that, lost our brand new executive director who had just been hired one week before that. Uh, she had seemed like a godsend and we're really sorry to have lost her, but she, um, she felt like she was walking into a, a impossible situation and that she didn't create it and it was kind of unpleasant to say the least. Um, then we had an executive committee meeting at which um, not only the normal executive committee but a whole bunch of other people were involved, including a bunch of county people, uh, airing some of the things that I guess they're unhappy about. But again, being we, we just felt like we were being blindsided with um, without really much direction. And so at the end of that meeting, um, the chair of EDFC board said, you know, since you're the ones that are bringing this, wanting us to do something different, can you please propose what it is you think you're expecting of us and then we can figure out whether we can do it or not. But we, we just really didn't know what what they needed from us. Um, but EDFC uh, now has no executive director again, but we do have two very, very competent staff people who I think are doing a fabulous job. And we are increasing our loans to, um, to new businesses and that's gonna help us, um, you know, quite, it helps our economy, it also helps EDFC's uh, ability to survive. And I think we'll make it through this, but it, it was not a, it, and that was the day after our city council meeting, which I'm seeing like, boy, everybody's on edge now. It's really a tough time. Um, we don't know what the future holds. And uh, so we're, uh, EDFC is working to, to keep going and do the right thing. Those are the two agencies I'm reporting on. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, Brad. Do you have any questions about yeah, that? I do have a quick question. Could you uh, bring back to some information on how many, uh, how many new loans were issued in the last 12 months by, by EDFC? Because I suspect that the county doesn't want to potentially support EDFC because of one, the, the budget issue, and two, I'm wondering if it could have something to do with the number of loans to our community and 
as a voter, I, I, wa- I want to know why our, why our county representatives um, are, are leaning that direction and whether or not, what their justification is. So if you could bring us that information later, I would appreciate it. Okay, I, in very rough numbers, um, I think our new loan officer who came on board about eight months ago, in those eight months, he's lent out about a million dollars. And there's about another million, and this is very rough numbers, but about another million um, that we have available to loan. So he's still very, um, you know, aggressively doing loan reviews and working with communities and trying to, to get um, good projects. And, of course, you can't just give loans because people ask. You have to vet them and make sure that they will actually be a good prospect and, and be able to pay back so that you have a, a constant revolving fund. And he's been really um, on the job on that. Um, and, and sort of in a nutshell, the the basic uh, criticism that Dan Jurdy um, leveled was that there's two agencies that both call themselves economic development um, there's West Company and there's EDFC, and he just felt like uh, we don't want two agencies overlapping and doing the same thing. And really, they aren't generally doing the same thing, and they are coordinating with each other, and we can do a better job of that. But um, but it was kind of, I think, we need to be more transparent about what, what the division of um, tasks are between EDFC and West Company, and that's that's where we're headed. The new executive director would have helped us get there, <laughs> but we don't have her anymore. Uh, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, I was just thinking back to when I when I served on it, on the uh, on that particular board and the conversation that took place by the County West Company and EDFC about consolidating the two and the cost and how the two boards would be consolidated. And it seemed like it was more expensive to for the two to work collaboratively together. It seems like this may be centered around cost saving. So, but I'd be curious to find out m- more. Yeah, and the one other thing was that uh, Dan Drudy had talked to the Eureka uh, equivalent, I think it's Arcade actually, a whatever it is, it's the equivalent of uh, EDFC, and they happen to have been loaning monies for 40 years, including a lot of really big projects, and they are self-supporting. But that's the only one in the state that we know of that, that can be totally self-supporting. So it was a little bit of a misunderstanding, on I think, on Dan's part, to think that EDFC could just live off of the um, in- interest from loans. It... it is rare that uh, an economic development l- lender can do that. Thank you, Mitch. Um, Anna? Um, let's see. Uh, the Museum Advisory Board is still on hold uh, during the shelter in place, and the um, Code of Conduct and Ethics ad hoc will be meeting this week on Friday. Um, Madge and Karen and I will get together to um, start working on that. So, looking forward to it. Yeah, MTA had a very long meeting this afternoon at 1.30. Um, the bulk of the meeting was around our finances. Because ridership is down significantly, of course, uh, we're going to see a dip in revenue. And we're yet to find out what amount will be reimbursed uh, should we get money from the CARES Act. Um, So lots of variables there. I shared with the uh, board uh, some feedback that I had gotten from Willits, uh, members of the Willits public um, that had concerns about MTA, specifically uh, bus 65 that normally runs from uh, the coast to uh, Willits and then uh, onward uh, or upward uh, towards uh, Sonoma County. We had stopped that route um, at the request of the uh, Fort Bragg City Council because we were trying to limit the uh, people moving around due to the COVID-19. However, we're finding that uh, 
more people are upset about the fact that uh, they're still moving about, but they're having to do it by unsafe means, for example, hitchhiking. So uh, they're... Carla Meyer, our executive director, she is reaching out to the Fort Bragg uh, City Council and the police chief over there to find out whether or not they would support reinstating the route that would only run from Willits to Fort Bragg each day. Uh, we wouldn't extend that to the south, just back and forth between those two areas. And then the second item I heard from the public about was in reference not just to MTA, but also the city of Willits. Uh, a disabled gentleman had uh, wanted some information about posting on our agendas and felt that um, on our agendas that it should say that disabled people um, need five business days. Um, they need the agenda five business days in advance so that they have the opportunity uh, to request uh, an accommodation of the city should it be needed. And uh, that wasn't our understanding with MTA, and I'm not sure uh, from the city's perspective if there's anything that's been updated in terms of ADA um, accessibility in our posting. So just wanted to throw that comment out there. And that's all I have to report. Uh, I the only thing I attended it was the Measure B meeting, and it uh, sounded like they kind of rehashed something that they'd already voted on, but they put out an RFI, or um, like basically to see whether or not they need a psychiatric hospital, a psychiatric health facility. Um, basically, they're trying to see what, whether there are any private providers that would be able to provide this, and it sounds like they're testing the waters so I um, uh, sounded like um, Allman had said and another member said that they'd already kind of asked about this as a board and uh, so they basically voted on it again and the other thing that uh, kind of popped up was that uh, Dr. Ace Parrish said that he's working with Howard Hospital not, not really a Measure B thing but that with Venice regarding uh, working on a homeless shelter in Willits, but I don't know if we've been contacting about that directly. So um, I know that I expressed you know, concerns of that case when I spoke to them a month ago. The one, um, they established one that they had to provide services. You just can't dump people in a uh, spot and fend for themselves. I uh, need a lot of services. It's, for those you build it in the comments, you build it, you got to be care of it. So, and that's all I had. Um, that, uh, Larry, uh, he was going to be attend, but I was planning on attending anyway. So, and I think at this point we are good uh, welfare. No, actually, council member reports and recommendations. Do we have any? Got it? Um, I received the email from the city manager regarding the um, presence of COVID in the wastewater that was tested. Um, and then I got a call today from Councilwoman Strong, who seemed to have more information um, than was conveyed in that email. So um, I'm, I understand that there's going to be some kind of workshop on Friday where city staff will learn more about the results of that test and, and what it fully means. And I would like to make a recommendation that um, the council be given an update on that workshop so that we can also understand that email. Thank you. I would also like to give that direction. Thank you, Greta. So are you, um, Ms. Bonnet, are you talking about having um, if this Friday thing, I actually haven't even found reference to it, but somebody else saw that um, Biobot is the company that did the test of our sewage influent and uh, found that there is virus in our in our sewage uh, and also in Brook Trails. Um, they apparently have an every Friday um, work, not a workshop, but a, you know, like a teleconference thing where anybody nationwide can ask them questions and they can say kind of what the meaning of their 
test results is. So I, I know that uh, Scott and I and Stephanie are experts in like what does their test mean? Like how how big of a percentage of our population is likely to be carrying this virus and all that? We don't know. So uh, I will try to find out when that um, think when that meeting is. But I think it is the same time as our ad hoc meeting, Greta. So I don't know if someone, maybe Scott can can, um, can attend it and find out more. Um, but what I was going to ask you do, do you want this report to come back at our next regular meeting, which will be July 8th? Is that what you're asking for? Well, uh, ideally, I would like information sooner than that. But, um, you know, I'm not giving any direction. I'm just saying I would like more information about this because the email that I got didn't explain much. To me, yeah, so like more. and, and let's, I'd love to chime in. This is Stephanie. I, as soon as I got the information, I, I sort of put it out what I had, um, and there were a lot of questions regarding what this even meant because both Scott and I didn't understand really the results. All we knew is that yes, indeed, it was in our system, but we didn't know what the numbers meant. Um, both Scott and I emailed Bio the, the company, and we got answers that we still didn't understand. And so we're still emailing them. <laughs> um, I wasn't aware of any meeting on Friday. If everybody from the nation can call, I'm guessing that that it would be very hard to get specific information. But both Scott and I are seeking to just find answers on, on what the numbers mean and um, can they tell how many people or, or anything like that. We just don't know at all. Um, so as I get information, I will pass that along. But please rest assured. Um, that Scott Herman and I are have been emailing and they're a little bit slow to respond but as soon as we get information we will um, notify council thank you and you also confirm whether or not the um, COVID was found in in the Brook Trails wastewater that's what Madge is saying but the email you sent out just said city of Lewis. Uh, and, and it did because the results that I got uh, but neither Scott nor I understood whether the oh, and i and i shared those with tamara as well because actually brook trails uh paid for that their own study and i emailed those results to her and she reached out to the company and none of us could really understand their answer on whether brook trails was indeed in, uh, affected certainly they were if there was an effect it was in a different way than willits yeah. but we still don't know what that difference is and so um I know that the their town manager is trying to get to the bottom of that as well. And Stephanie, you, there was also a reported case in Willits, uh, I think over the weekend, um, that was somebody who walked into the hospital for some other reason, but then was tested and found to be um, an asymptomatic uh, carrier. Is that correct? Um, I think that for the privacy of the person involved, that information is not public and I and I it's only through gossip sort of just hearing but so that that has not ever been officially released um, the only thing that we're sort of entitled to hear is in what general area a person is for their privacy concerns and um, so I don't know I don't I cannot confirm that okay can I, can I just raise the, the sort of um, the bottom line for me is that we probably have a case in Willits uh, individual, but we also know that it's in our sewage influent, which means we know there's virus being carried in our city limits. Uh, Dr. Drew Colfax's reports and also um, Dr. Duhan's reports that have been coming out, you know, more than weekly now. Uh, Dr. Colfax is on KZYX three times a week. Um, anyway, we we have the virus in our community. The, the numbers in our county are going up, and the numbers everywhere else are also going up. Because we're opening up so much of the economy, that's kind of inevitable. But I, I feel, um, given that we now know that we have it already present in our community, we're on the verge of potentially a, a big surge. Uh, under those circumstances, I really would like us as the council to reconsider 
the uh, the urgency ordinance that we that failed to pass last time, last two weeks ago, because to me that gives us a potential tool which we can use very very uh, judiciously and scarcely. I hope, but at least it gives us something to say that we're not just asking people to comply; that we have a tool at our at our disposal, short of arresting people, which is you know not a desirable. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, we we would like to start short of that. Have tools that are that are more subtle and more usable than that. So um, I understand that you know that we had only three votes and we needed four. If either of the two votes that didn't support it in the past would reconsider, given that we do have cases now in our in our very own community. Um, I feel I would like to to be able to reconsider that vote and that ordinance. Hey, um, anybody else have anything under uh, number of reports and recommendations? Hey, good and welfare. We have any good and welfare. I got tested yesterday. Okay. Anybody else? All right, I'll throw one in there. Um, I am on the West Company Board and um, trying to do what I can for businesses. I know uh, what I can do and that point. Kind of a good news thing is they're, they're, they're doing a lot of webinars. They normally do a lot of training. Normally, they're in-person uh, things, but they're, they're webinars in light of our COVID crisis. And that one on reopening and recovery workplace safety tomorrow from 3 to 4 p.m. If you go to the West Company uh, Business Center website, are you on there? Talks about self-certification, contact uh, tracing, checklist by industry. And uh, just keep that in mind that that's out there. It's kind of guidance for businesses out there that kind of help to try and get you opened up to know what you need to do i think it's all a matter of you know it's not about picking on people it's about um, keeping our economy open I, I some of you may have seen the stuff from the league of cities you get from sarah and it's saying there that uh, for some of the money tied to may be able to get is going to be tied they're going to have i haven't seen the metrics yet as to whether or not how they're going to see that we're doing our part. So folks aren't doing what they're doing. It hurt our ability to get funding for the city. So that's what I got. And at this point, we have a session notice uh, pursuant to government code 54957, recruitment of potential public employee, recruitment of a city man. Going to, uh, I'll, I'll report out if we have anything to report. as a council and being in closed session. Oh, Jay, uh, or I guess actually Kathy. Okay, I see. Kathy has her hand up too. Um, logistically, can we have about a five or ten minute break at least? And then we, yeah. have, to, we have to call in and not use the same. That's what we have to send out. Correct. Do you all have that number? I'll have to go find it again. Okay. About a few minutes. All right, for the rest of the public, thank you very much. Thank you.